Hello lovely people, welcome to the Geek Cupboard. I am Penge and it's Sunday night, which means more Sunday night story time here in the Geek Cupboard with Tally Ho. So get your cup of tea prepared, take a seat, get all comfy and cosy and we shall dive in. So a quick recap from last time, we had to smuggle some prize peacocks out of Rory's room, past the police no less, and we put them into the boathouse, where we happened across the Big Bearded Bernard, which is the name of the boat that's going to feature in the rowing regatta thing that's been planned. Someone called Glenna then gave us some all-natural herbs enhancements for the rowers. Inspector Ambrose then accused Valentine of being light-fingered Lou, so of course we decided to break her out of the police station. We surprisingly managed to do just that, and we discovered that she was actually an actress who was practicing for a part as a maid, and now we find ourselves in the village just in time for the Village Harvest Festival to begin. And now we head into chapter 8, called the Harvest Festival, which I believe is the final proper chapter of the story. There's an epilogue, I think, you know, tacked onto the end, but we shall include that at the end of this chapter, which means that this is it. This is the final full proper chapter of Tally Ho and the epilogue, the end of the story. So here we go. Let's see how everything ties together. Let's see how the story of Tally Ho ends. A harvest is a time when all the preparation, all of the hard work and nurturing of little seeds come to fruition and one gathers in the fruits of one's labour. It is a well-known saying that one reaps what one sows. As it happens, that is as true in this narrative as it is in agriculture. I see what you're doing there. Essentially, that's saying that all the decisions we've made, so everything that we've sown across the previous seven chapters, we are now going to reap in this final chapter. Okay, yep, that's fine. So let's see what the results of all of our decisions are. Cupboard, cries Rory as you approach with Valentine next to you. And who is that? Frankincense says. That couldn't be. Valentine peeks out from under her hat. I'm all right. Cupboard saved me from the dungeons of Inspector Ambrose. Uh, well, good, says Aunt Primrose. Is that good, Rory? I think it's good. Or would this create even more scandal? I think it's just fine, says Rory. Uh, well, welcome back to my household, Murgatroyd, says Aunt Primrose. <laughs> we take care of our own at Ritornello. Wait a moment. Are you in fact an evil sneak thief? Valentine, madam. No, madam. Uh, well, good. Inspector Ambrose, I did quite the ass this morning, I think. Welcome back. Everyone crowds around and makes a fuss over Valentine. The key is to find the true villain, Frankincense says. Then the stain of scandal will be removed from Valentine. Oh, yes, of course, said Aunt Primrose. I assume you are handling that cupboard. That seems like your department. But now I think of it, cupboard. I may have an even more crucial task for you. Okay, what can it be? Oh, my goodness me. We're missing two rowers, is the problem, Frankincense says. Two of the servants have taken ill and have had to cancel. Can you do it? Aunt Primrose looks at you with hope in her eyes. You cannot refuse such an offer from an aunt in need, a new ascent. Who do you recommend as the most fitting rowing partner for you, Aunt Primrose asks. Oh my goodness me. Okay, so we can row with Rory. We shall be an unstoppable team. We shall row with Miss Signet Signet, so pointing to Frankincense. We could row with Hayes, okay, or we could row with Valentine. I, I genuinely don't know. I really actually don't know. Um... I mean, I don't know. Rory might be a good option because, you know, we get on. We get on and we will want to do well. And Rory will want to do well for Aunt Primrose. And then also, as well, if he does do well, then, you know, she'll be very proud of him. And then she'll, you know, he'll be sort of viewed a bit better in her eyes. Frankincense, I don't know. I don't know if she'd want to do that kind of thing. Um, Hayes might be quite good. And then whilst we're rowing, we could have a bit of a chat about the fact that, you know, she's a sneak thief. Or Valentine. Let's go for Rory. Why not? We're good buddies with Rory. Let's go with Rory. Thank you for the vote of confidence, says Rory, with a little shimmy of pleasure. If you think so, cupboard, says Aunt Primrose, we'll all be counting on you. She puts strong emphasis on the word you. Lord knows we haven't had much luck in past years. Ah oh, well, at the very least now we might improve on last year's disaster. In my defence, Rory says, I don't think it was made perfectly clear at the start of the race which direction the finish line was supposed to be. So I don't think you need to glance in my direction when you say that. I'm sure you'll do your very best, says Frankincense, and that's what counts. You understand that this is a race, Rory, suggesting that the intention is to get to the designated finish line as quickly as possible. Aunt Primrose wrinkles her nose. I do, Rory says hotly. Have it your way then, cupboard. I suppose stranger things have happened. I suggest we walk into town to get some pear brandy swizzles. They sound amazing. I don't know what they are, but I would like some pear brandy swizzles of my very own. Uh, pear brandy swizzles to fend off the chill to help us see the back of this whole affair, says Aunt Primrose. You, what's your name? She says to Valentine. Hope my walking stick will adjust my firm off. There we are. Pick up the pace, everyone. Hop. You walk in the rear, taking the sights of the festival lost in thought. What are you thinking about as you walk? 
Okay, how best to defeat Aunt Primrose's competition? Whether I'm up to the task of rowing the big bearded Bernard to victory. <laughs> it's wonderful seeing that there. Whether I will be accepted into the inner circle at the Cadbury Club. Whether I would like a piece of funnel cake with powdered sugar. The nature of being a proper servant. I mean, it's either how best to defeat the competition or whether I'd like a piece of cake. I mean, really, my mind strays from cake not very often at all. Cake and tea. Um, however, however, if we're in that situation, we've just been told we were going to go and do some rowing, and there's quite a lot at stake because, you know, Aunt Primrose's reputation is at stake, Rory's reputation is at stake, and also uh, Rory's kind of, you know, income, his, his sort of uh, money he gets from Aunt Primrose, that could also be at stake. Maybe we should think about how best to defeat the competition, but would that be what Cupboard would be thinking of? Or would Cupboard be thinking of the nature of being a proper servant? Although being a proper servant would be helping your master, and our master is Rory, and we want Rory to do well in the competition. I don't think we'd be thinking about the inner circle of the Cadbury Club, and I don't think whether we would be worrying about whether we're up to the task of it, because I think we'd be quite confident in that. But, um, Joe you know what? Let's go for that one. How best to defeat Aunt Primrose's competition? There are so many ways to ensure that an opponent's boat does not win a race, you think. One can damage the boat itself, distract the crew, or have them unfairly accused of an infraction. Also, one can row faster than them. Opinions fly through your mind, and you begin pondering your strategy. You are in the midst of these compelling thoughts when a st awakens you from your reverie. It is Aunt Primrose's chef, Beauregard, in his kitchen whites, wearing his chef's toque, toque is that pronounced? Um, he holds his flower-covered portfolio and a pen. Oh, this is the French chap. Oh, no. <laughs> right, okay, prepare for a terrible French accent, ready? Ah, cupboard, he says. So you will indeed do to be rowing, eh? I just saw scrubs. You are soon to be coxswain. She is, I just say, warming up. She says that Miss Patterson told us that you will have no small part in the creating the strategy for the big bearded Bernard, which sounds amazing to be said in French. Ah, yes. It strikes me that you have not yet made le wager on the boatres. Perhaps you would like the chance to make some money, no? You look around. Everyone is busy looking in a bookstore window, or, uh, and nobody is paying attention to you. It would be good to earn some money for Rory, or for yourself, for that matter, because, yeah, we have spent quite a bit. Of course, you would hate to lose money, but surely that never happens when one gambles. Absolutely not. Come, come, Cabot, says Beauregard. Naturellement, you wish to bet. Here is the odd sheet for your delectation. He hands you an informal, uh, an informational, sorry, document. Mrs. Patterson's boat, the big bearded Bernard, pays two to one odds. Colonel Firesnuff's boat, the Firesnuff, oh come on, that's a little bit self-aggrandizing, pays one to one odds. The Benevolent Policeman's Association boat, the Long Arm, very good, pays two to one odds. The Worshipful Company of Cordwainer's boat, the Hell for Leather, <laughs> pays 20 to one odds. So no bets. We can bet on Firesnuff, we can bet on us, bet on the police, bet on the Cordwainer's. I mean, we've got, we do have the, the sort of herbal enhancement things. But, I mean, we could just go for it. Maybe we're, we're now we're in control. Now we're part of this sort of uh, whole boat race. Maybe we can influence it. So yeah, we do actually do quite well. Let's bet on us. I'll bet on Mrs. Patterson's team. I have high hopes for the big bearded Bernard, and who doesn't? As uh, as our American, oh, hang on, that's French. As our American, American friends sing, you're going to root, root, root for the home team. Yes, by regard, chortles, something like that. You say. Oh, so don't win. It's a shame, he notes. You smile thinly. Now tell me, friend, what is the amount you wish to wager? Okay, now we don't have much money left. Ten, five, or nothing. Let's just wager five, shall we? We might need to keep a little bit of money aside for something else. Um, I don't think we, we obviously don't have 20 readies anymore. Let's just put five down. We can win a tiny bit of money back. Let's just do that, shall we? Um, 500 it is, says Beauregard, his tongue quivering. I say toe quivering with excitement. Uh, no, just just five, you say. Five? I cannot figure out. Just five? But seeing your face, he says, Calm down, my friend. I just tell a joke. Hmm. A wager of five, then? Good. Beauregard accepts your money with a practiced flick of his hand, closes his portfolio in a contented manner, and gives you a deep and flourish-filled bow, sweeping his toque, again, not quite sure how you say that, toque, off his head. He then places the money into his toque and places it on his head. A pleasure doing of the business with you. I will find you out after the race. No doubt to give you your winnings. He strolls away to accost other honest citizens before the race. <laughs> okay. It is at this moment that you hear some commotion from, from Aunt Primrose and the others. They are standing in front of the local bookstore, The Turning Leaf, where a poster is prominently displayed in the front window. The poster reads as follows. Coming soon. 
Tawdry Lace, the latest novel by Fifi Buttercup, is an unmissable tour de force guaranteed to make you gasp on every page. Those who knew Marigold thought of her as a handsome and dignified society matron, impeccably moral, the soul of virtue. But if they could gaze into her soul and see her passionate past, filled with scandalous desires and torrid affairs, they would respond with a mixture of fascination and disbelief. Who would have thought that this pillar of society was, in her youth, a showgirl? Hide this under your pillows when company comes, Miss Carlotta Cloak Motive. You will blush, but you will read. Admiral Nigel Pinnacle, retired. This filth ought to be banned from our fair land. <laughs> the right Reverend Gerard Hastings, oh dear. And there, on the curve of the novel, is an illustration of a woman who looks very much like Aunt Primrose. The similarity is unmistakable. Uh, who's talking here? Rory, okay. Oh, I say, it's the new Fifi Buttercup. I can hardly wait, says Rory. I, oh, dear, Aunt Primrose, are you quite all right? I had a rumour that a tell-all purporting to expose my youth was in the offing, but I did not expect this, cries Aunt Primrose. Her voice approaches apoplectic levels. That is a very good likeness, says Hayes. The hair is spot on. You can see that Aunt Primrose is on the verge of explosive anger. Who knows at whom it will be unleashed. You have, however, an opportunity to try to modulate her mood, but you must step lightly, lest her rage fall upon you. Okay. So we can either say, this has obviously been time to vex you, Mrs. Patterson, just before the competition. You must channel that anger into the winning spirit. Now is the time to fight, I shout, hoping I can, conspire, I can spark her competitive spirit to mighty deeds. That sounds good, because she is competitive. She will want to win this race, won't we, so she can be the best. Uh, surely this puts everything into perspective, Mrs. Patterson. It makes you realise what is important in life. Love, friends and family. Not the slings and arrows of Fifi Buttercup, I say to get her to use this, this experience to be more patient with those around her. I don't think she'd go for that. I think she's so furious that she'd just tell us to go away. Let's go for this top one here. There you go. We shall try and um, spark her competitive spirit to mighty deeds. Yes, quite right, shouts Aunt Primrose, taking fire from your words. This was obviously meant to dull my spirit, but it shall not. There! She heaves a cobblestone through the window of the shop, seizes the poster, and tears it in twain. <laughs> <laughs> the bookseller of the turning leaf runs out in dismay, only to face a livid Aunt Primrose. She heaves a cobblestone through... She basically just smashed the window. Okay. Um, how dare you sell that filth, she says. Just libelous, and I won't stand for it. Puh. Come along, everyone. Let us leave this den of iniquity. Iniquity, even. As she turns away, she comes face to face with Colonel Firesnuff, who has been watching her. Well, what seems to be the problem, Primrose? He says with a bit of a smirk. Read any good books lately? <laughs> I do like that Fifi Buttercup. But instead of turning away shamefaced, she looks to you and nods, and you nod back. With steely determination, she turns back to Colonel Firesnuff and hisses at him something that makes even the bold Colonel step back a pace. <laughs> we'll settle this on the honourable field of battle then, says Colonel Firesnuff, straightening up. Exotic animals in sixty minutes. What does that mean? <laughs> what does exotic animals in sixty minutes mean? I will destroy you utterly. I will out-exotic you as you have never been out exotic she says, and then walks away with great dignity. Colonel Firesniff looks shaken by her words and stands watching her walk away. What's all this exotic animals malarkey about? What's going on there? You arrive in the town centre, where excited shopkeepers are hanging swags of autumn leaves in their storefronts, and the village children play such raucous games as neckball, scoop the can, and squash and hide, amidst much giggles and screaming. Various games of skill and chance are crowded with would-be stuffed bear owners and large attractions, such as the Tunnel of Love, a Ferris Wheel, a Haunted House, the Maze of Mirrors, and the Travelling Natural History Museum are seeing a brisk trade as well. Figs lingers nearby, next to an organ grinder, watching Mopsy and trying to keep out of Aunt Primrose's line of sight. So yeah, essentially all the characters are going to be here, aren't they? Everyone is going to be here for this final chapter. There is my love, says Mopsy to Aunt Primrose, defiantly pointing to Figs. Look how he follows my every move. Surely you must respect his faithfulness. I'm doing my very best to ignore that odd fellow, says Aunt Primrose. I'm getting some stimulating beverages to take the edge off my having laid eyes on him. Aunt Primrose purchases an assortment of pear brandy swizzles and is just doling them out when she utters a piercing cry and points vigorously across the town square, splattering pear brandy everywhere. D my peacocks! There! Catch them! Where did they go? You look around, but you don't see them. You're seeing things, Auntie, says Mopsy, deep into her second pear brandy swizzle. Oh, she's going to be sloshed. Um, I'm not seeing things, she says, stamping her foot and losing some more brandy. Everyone, fan out, catch them, go in pairs, gently, quickly. 
you look around and select a partner who would not only be helpful to hunt with, but with whom the prospect of conversation entices. Okay, so Hayes, Rory. Oh, hang on, right, so we go to with a person and to a place. So Hayes in the haunted house, Rory in the tunnel of love. I think it might have to be that. Valentine, Ferris wheel, Mopsy maze of mirrors, frankincense, the traveling natural history museum. I mean, I'm not so bothered about talking to Valentine. Yeah, Valentine, yeah, we've helped her out and that's kind of it. And, you know, she knows how we feel about her, I think. Frankincense, again, not bothered. Hayes, it could be quite good to go and have a talk with Hayes just so we could have a chat about the fact that we know that she's the sneak thief and she knows that we know that she's a sneak thief. But then, yeah, do we want to chat with her or do we want to go with Rory into the tunnel of love and just see what happens there? We're going with Rory into the tunnel of love. Of course we are. You and Rory look to each other and then walk in step over to the tunnel of love. Aunt Primrose is in a terrible rush, but Rory is not. The Tunnel of Love, Rory says. That is where we are heading. Yes, sir. Uh, if I might, come, but I wonder if... I know I've been a frightful menace about this whole wedding thing. I've been rather horrible, haven't I? I haven't treated you fairly. I would understand if you were angry or confused, or even if you wanted to leave my service, but I hope you don't. I want you to stay. And now that I'm not... I'm not uh, attached any official capacity to frankincense... I wonder whether we might... Rory trails off, perplexed. I wonder whether we might continue on in our perfectly professional relationship, you mean, I say mildly. Yes, I love you too, sir, and now you are free. Or I think I shall need to think matters over and let the dust settle, sir, I say. It is too soon just now to make this sort of decision. No, we're... it's all out in the open. It's all out in the open. We had a bit of a... a bit of a sort of romantic embrace at one point, well, after the whole sort of... Uh, theft debacle thing. So absolutely. Yes, I love you too, sir. And now you are free. Absolutely. 100%. I suppose I am free, Rory says, looking at you with soft eyes. And you are right here. As ever, sir. And so what now? Rory says. We have a good deal of time to figure that out. I do love your cupboard, Rory says. I do. Since the moment you came in for that interview, I knew. You do remember, don't you? Of course I do. And you told me that you tend to become emotionally attached to your employers. I recall it with perfect clarity, sir. You and Rory walk over to the Tunnel of Love, which is a dimly lit plaster grotto with an artificial river running through it. There are log-shaped boats with just enough room for two people sitting closely, which drift lazily along the river. The barker stands outside by a large paddle wheel, which turns slowly and majestically, creating the current for the log boats. It is precisely at this moment that you see the three peacocks sitting on one of the logs of the Tunnel of Love, which drifts off into the darkness just as you approach. I wonder if this is where the peacocks always were, or you know, if you go to each location, whichever you choose, the peacocks are there. How intriguing, I do not know. You and Rory run as quickly as you can to the ticket booth, cutting to the front of the long line. One ticket for two at once, says Rory. Rather, two tickets for one. Sorry, uh, two tickets, if you please, you say to the barker, handing over the money. For the two of you, says the barker, sizing you up both coolly. The tunnel of love? For both of you? Yes, for the two of us, said Rory, suddenly straightening up, a boldness creeping into his voice. We are going to go on this ride together, the two of us. That's fine, says the barker. Rory holds out a hand to you. You notice it shaking slightly. Okay, I take Rory's hand. Sir, we may wish to proceed more efficiently onto the ride, or I kiss Rory. I mean, okay, this is lovely. It'll be a lovely moment, but we are trying to find the peacocks. So how about... I don't think I don't think I don't think we should have a kiss. I don't think we, smooching is going to help. I think maybe let's just take his hand. Let's take his hand, get onto the boat thing, and then we'll just get on with it, shall we? You take Rory's hand and look into his eyes for a few moments, absolutely clogging up the front of the line. Elderly couples start shaking their fists at you, and someone shouts, "Move along, move along!" I'm proud to take your hand, cupboard. Rory says, "And I, you, sir," you respond. I think the depth of our relationship might be reflected by holding hands. What are hands anyway? when you come right down to it. We all have them, after all, and they are freely on display, you point out. That's right, cupboard, as always, you cut right to the heart of the matter. They are nothing, hands. Look at them everywhere. And yours is touching mine, you say. It really means very... Oh, it really means very little, says the barker, waving onto the bride with his own exposed hands. If you could uh, kindly... Rory nods. Here, look, I'm touching this platform here. And the contents of this trash bin. A, a bit moist, that. <laughs> and now the jacket of this fellow in front of me. It doesn't matter. Just hands. Good show, sir. Shall we board holding hands? Indeed we shall. And we shall solve the mystery of the missing peacocks. You and Rory board and the barker shoves your boat forward into the dark tunnel. The gentle current takes you and you drift lazily along through a winding path. You can dimly see the outline of other couples nestling into each other on logs around you, although the logs directly in front of you are empty. 
Those peacocks must be several logs ahead of us, Rory says, but I'm hopeful we'll catch up. I don't think it works like that, sir. The logs will remain in this order. Uh, yes, yes, of course, Rory says. So that there's no particular hurry either? I suppose not, not especially. Would you care to sit and enjoy the ride with me? Just for a few minutes, we could sit close to each other and drift along. Okay, right. Uh, I just think we ought to focus on catching the peacocks now, perhaps another time. Yes, I'd love to, Rory, I say, and could look to him. Certainly, sir, it would be a pleasure. I mean, now, cupboard here would be torn. Cupboard would be torn with what to do. Do we focus on catching the peacocks? Because that's the important and professional thing to do. But now, the thing we've been waiting for for ages, it's here. It's right here with us. Um, which one do we go for? I mean, that is tempting. Just to get on with the job and just go, right, we need the peacocks. Go and find them. But then, do we cuddle up to Rory? Because that just sounds lovely as well. Or keep it slightly more professional. That might make Rory slightly sort of offish. Certainly, sir, it would be a pleasure. Um, Joe, no, let's do that. Let's have a nice cuddle in the tunnel of love. How very lovely. You and Rory nestle together as if your bodies have been designed explicitly to curl into one another. This is nice, Rory, you breathe. Yes, it is, Penge. Oh, he's calling me by our proper name, not covered. Ooh, he says, very nice. I don't want it to end. It's so dark in here. It feels like I'm dreaming. It's like that Shakespeare play, the bit about going gently down the stream and life is but the dream. The Tempest, I think. Yes, Rory, I think that's right. Okay, hang on. So, I kiss Rory, I rest my head on Rory's shoulder. I suddenly sit up straight, remembering something I wanted to tell Rory about our newspaper home delivery. <laughs> Is that something that I'm supposed to remember from earlier? Because I really don't. Let's just, let's rest our head on his shoulder. Let's not go for the full-on sort of smooching. Let's just enjoy a lovely, sort of peaceful, romantic moment with him. I rest my head on Rory's shoulder. You put your head down on Rory's shoulder for a while and close your eyes. Everything that has happened to you over the past two days flashes before your mind, but you try to push those thoughts away. For this moment, there is only you and Rory and the darkness and the flowing water. You like Rory's smell, and you like the feeling of his shoulder and your cheek, and you like his arm around you. We might pause here just for a moment, take a deep breath, close our eyes, and imagine that darkness, that drifting, and that kiss. We might hold on to that moment, but like a yellow leaf on an oak tree, that moment cannot last. Alas, it doesn't say next, it says alas on the button. I, I suppose we should consider catching those birds now, Rory says. Yes, I suppose I should call you Cupboard for the time being. I'm just used to it. I understand, sir. I, I prefer being called Cupboard, to be perfectly honest. Um, what's the plan then, Rory says, shivering a bit with the motion. We're going to have to jump from log to log, you say. I think I see the peacocks five logs ahead of us, frolicking about just there. I think that's a woman with a peacock feather hat. No, perhaps you are right, Rory says. It's so dark in here. If this ride is a big circle, couldn't we just stay outside and call them when they emerged? It's much better to catch them in this confined area, sir. Let us proceed carefully. You and Rory jump to the empty log boat in front of you, and then the next one. But before you can move closer, the logs enter a low ceiling tunnel. You'll have to wait until you emerge to move forward further. Okay, are you confident in your peacock grabbing abilities? You might leave that to me. When you see them, do not hesitate. I will steady the log and you leap at them with all due expediency, we ought to grab them together. I will go high and you go low. I think we grab them together. I think we have two people grabbing peacocks rather than just one. Yeah, let's do that. Got it, says Rory. Although perhaps we should both go low since peacocks are not very tall. If we both go low, we run the risk of crashing into each other, you say. Are you picturing a sort of diving motion, a leaping grab? Yes, sir. It is the best way to take them by surprise. Uh, perhaps you should go high and I should go low then. That is what I originally said, sir. There's only one thing to remember. You go high. So you want me to go high? All right, if that's what you want. It really doesn't matter, sir, so long as we choose different ones. Could we go left and right? I feel like I can remember that better. I'll go left and you go right. That is just fine, sir. Rory hums nervously. I understand perfectly, he says quietly. I should probably check to make sure Rory actually understands. Surely Rory has this simple plan committed to memory now. <laughs> actually, since you're on the left side of the boat, you should probably go left and Rory should go right. I'll just let him know that. Oh no, it's all going to go horribly wrong and we're going to fall in, aren't we? <laughs> okay, I should probably check to make sure Rory actually understands. Let's just do that, shall we? Although to be fair, hang on. Yeah, we're on the left side of the boat. So we should really suggest that we go left. Otherwise, we are just going to jump across each other and then we're going to crash. Let's do that. Let's suggest that we go different ways. Just a quick adjustment, sir. It strikes me that I should go left and you should go right. From the perspective of the peacocks, you mean? 
no, from your perspective. Oh, I was thinking from the perspective of the birds this whole time. So no change for me then. So when you say right, I just translate that into left. All right, sir. So you'll go right, which in your mind you hear as left. Stage left, yes. No, stage left means from the perspective of the performers, not the audience. <laughs> this is ridiculous. I don't wish to have a literary discussion just at the moment, covered. I have it perfectly. Thank you. You emerge from the tunnel, and together you leap to the log just behind the peacocks. They frisk about, not paying any attention to you. Instead, their interest is drawn by a dimly lit emergency door, slightly ajar in the rear of the ride. The birds look like they are considering making a bid for freedom out the door. You glance at Rory. You feel quite confident that he is going to dive to the left. Now you cry, and you dive. <laughs> but which left? Which left is he diving to? I don't know. So he's going stage left. Hang on. Hang on. So stage left, which is from the perspective of the audience. Yeah, he thinks he's going to jump, as we're looking at it, to the left, I think. So I think we should go to the right. I have a terrible feeling we're going to crash into each other, but okay. <laughs> let's just let's see how this goes whatever um like a well-oiled machine a machine that tries to tackle peacocks in dark tunnels you dive right and rory dives left it could not be a more graceful example of bird catching a bright light blinds you for a moment and you realize there are flash cameras strategically placed around the ride to capture images of couples kissing in the dark to sell to them for souvenirs you and rory have just been snapped however in midair in perfect synchrony lunging toward three startled peacocks just as we planned, cupboard, cries Rory. Wait a moment, one got away. Rory is right. You have Sanchi-san, and Rory has Orlando. You spot Galatea, however, ducking, if ducking is the right word for what a peahen does, out the back door. Oh, bother. You follow Galatea closely, her fellow peacocks getting more and more excited and active as you and Rory carried them. You would have thought they would have been lulled by their recent dim and relaxing cruise through the tunnel of love, but no such luck. Finally, Galatea stops in front of a brightly coloured and richly decorated stand in a small park ringed with food stalls. Galatea is looking at something with great interest. Sanchi-san and Orlando whistle plaintively, almost begging. Maybe let's put them down, cupboard. They seem to want to show us something. They can hardly run far with both of us here. And I think they, we have demonstrated that we are in charge here, to a great, to a great extent. All right. With some misgivings, you and Rory put Sanchi-san and Orlando down, and they join Galatea. Okay, what are they looking at? You and Rory look up from the three peacocks, taking in your surroundings more fully. A sign informs you that you are standing in front of the delectable Indian confection stand. It smells of cardamom, cloves, and black pepper. A woman, wearing a bejeweled orange and green silk sari decorated with a peacock, sits at a table with her three children, a boy and two little girls. They finish their lunch as the three peacocks crowd her and try to poke at the image of the peacock on her sari. She and the children are laughing. Are these your peacocks? They're beautiful, but they seem hungry, says the woman in the sari. Come on, Sanchi-san, Orlando and Galatea, you say. I know you like the picture of the peacock, but now we have to get back. The older of the three children, a boy of about eight, points to the peacocks. Why are these here? Can we keep them? Okay, so I guess they like you. I don't think there's any thought process going on within the tiny heads of these birds. Um... I'd love to stay in chat, but I am rather too busy at the moment to indulge in deep conversation with you. Um, I mean, that's a bit insulting. That's a little bit demeaning. I mean, I guess they like you. We, we can't let them keep them, of course, but I guess they like you seems the most polite response. And I think that's the one that Cupboard would go for. All peacocks like me, says the boy. I rode on an elephant by myself. An elephant? By yourself? Rory says, looking around. Not here, clarifies the boy. Back home. The mother introduces herself. I'm Tanvir Grover. We own a little peacock range where we live, near Puna. Beautiful open woods, lots of freedom for them to range around, explains Mrs Grover. But my children's favourite three birds died last year. She whispers the word died. Oh, sorry, my children's favourite three birds died last year. Um, these look a lot like them. Finish up, Angie and Angie. Wipe your mouth, Rab. There's your father. Probably come to tell us that our cab is here. I don't want to leave England. I wanted the rest of the fair. We've been here for two weeks. I told you that we'd only be able to stay at the fair for a bit before we had to go. You don't want us to miss our ship, do you? The peacocks nuzzle the legs of the children and then look up at you. Time to go, says Mr Grover, a distinguished looking man wearing a leisure suit as he walks briskly over. I hope you finish lunch. Oh, hello, new friends and birds. The cab is waiting. The peacocks love me, say Angie and Andrew in unison, laughing as Galatea and Orlando tickle their tummies. Oh no, I can see where this is going. Aunt Primrose will be out of her mind angry if we return without them. 
I hate the thought of her mourning her prized birds. Though these kids are very cute, I'll grant them that. Okay. I asked the Grover family if they would like to take the peacocks with them to India. I placed Galatea, Orlando, and Sanchisan between me and the Grover family and allowed the birds to choose their own fate. I insist the peacocks come with me at once and return to Aunt Primrose for the exotic animal show. Oh, that's what the that's what the exotic out exotic thing was about. The exotic animal show. I mean, really, these people here, the Grovers, they own a peacock, whatever it was, a peacock range back in wherever it was near Pune, it says up there. So yeah, they've got plenty of peacocks, and these peacocks, whilst they might like this family, they are not hers. They've not reared them or whatever. They've not been looking after them. And, you know, they're on primroses. And whilst it seems quite nice to say, there you go, would you like to take these with you? You know, they've got to take them on a boat. And I imagine there's all sorts of complicated forms to fill in about sort of, you know, taking animals with you and such like. And I don't really think it's the right thing to do to give them away because they're not ours to give away anyway. And, you know, whilst the children are very lovely, you know, that, that's, they've got a whole load of peacocks back at their place. So I think the peacocks come back with us. I, I don't think it would be a good idea for us to get rid of them. As nice as it would be for the peacocks to go and join their, you know, their kind at the range, it's not our decision to make, I don't believe. So there we go. We'll insist the peacocks come with me at once and return to Aunt Primrose for the exotic animal show. Galatea, Sanchi-san, Orlando, you say. Come on now, playtime is over. It's nearly time for the exotic animal show where you will do Ritornello proud, possibly winning ribbons and untold glory. The peacocks look at you and the Grover family, and then hide behind the children, trying to avoid your gaze. I can see you, you say. That is an ineffective hiding spot. But they clearly don't want to come with you. Indeed, they're making it as clear as they can that they wish nothing more than to depart Woodland Centre forever and start a new life in India with this family that they have just met. We need not linger further over the cajoling, do you pronounce that? Uh, wheedling and physical wrestling that ensues at this point. Suffice to say that you managed to get three rather disappointed peacocks away from the Grovers, across the meadow, and back to the long-suffering Aunt Primrose. I mean, okay, I know it will upset the peacocks, but, you know, it, 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 they're, not, they're not ours to choose what to do with. I kind of feel like that was the right choice. Not a nice choice, but I think that was the right choice overall. They protest loudly and then sink into what you would call a moody state as you approach Aunt Primrose. Clearly, they do not have much fire for the exotic animal show. Oh no. Oh dearie me. You found them, cries Aunt Primrose, grabbing your hands in a moment of unbridled glee. Come, the exotic animal show is starting in just 20 minutes. Bustle everyone, step lively, take those birds, get me a glass of cider, an apple turnover for the road. Strike up a patriotic marching tune. Onward to victory! You all walk to the mayor's house as quickly as possible. A song on Aunt Primrose's lips. 20 minutes later, you all find yourself behind the mayor's house where the exotic animal show is just about to get underway. This year, the stronger competitors include a sugar glider, a collection of immature lobsters, a python, a red panda, and of course, Yasmina, Colonel Firesnuff's yak. <laughs> okay, he's got a yak. Tables with bright cloths are scattered around the grounds, each with a number. Festive orange and gold ribbons and garlands decorate the area. A scarecrow in the centre of the table uh, bears a placard reading, Welcome to the Exotic Animal Show. Okay. Thought we wouldn't make it, Primrose, says Colonel Firestuff. I assume you'd recognise the obvious superiority of my yak. Well, you thought quite wrong, she says, snapping her fingers in front of his face. The exotic animal show begins, with each competitor standing by their animal or animals, as a panel of distinguished judges, the mayor, his father-in-law, and the treasurer of the local Teacup Poodle Fancier Society. <laughs> that sounds amazing. I examine each animal minutely for beauty, poise, and je ne sais quoi. They each make careful notes on a clipboard, writing in various subscores and ratings. As the judging proceeds, there are a number of exciting and useful things you might do to help. What do you wish to do in order to achieve the desired results? Okay, right, so what can we do? Annoy Colonel Firesnuff to rattle him. Give Aunt Primrose a pep talk. I assist Aunt Primrose in primping the peacocks. I try to adjust the score sheet of the treasurer of the local teacup poodle fancy society. As she has left her clipboard unattended momentarily, a highly risky venture, but success could very well tip the balance or just sort of do nothing at all. I, I mean, that's kind of cheating. I, I, I don't really want to be doing cheaty things, not, not necessarily in this particular situation. So um, I think let's just help Aunt Primrose primp the peacocks. Let's get them looking as good as they can be. Let's do that, I think. If you will allow me, madam, you say, I think there are just a few last minute details you could see to in order to make the peacocks just a little more attractive and appeal to the aesthetic sensibilities of the judges. Oh, uh, I don't, starts Aunt Primrose. If I may just smooth Sanchisan's tail, you say, like stroking it to remove any debris from his busy morning. 
Sanchi San screeches at you, and Aunt Primrose does as well. You can't smooth a tail in that direction, you incompetent tail stroker, she barks. You're messing it up. The image was a light touch. Heavens, what do they teach you people? Uh, train uh, training for service these days. You've bent a feather. Look at it. Indeed, one feather appears to have a slightly more pronounced arc than before. Aunt Primrose tusks, tusks and fusses. Ah, uh, well, perhaps they won't notice. The judges stroll by. They notice. You will have enough time to do one more thing before the judging is over. What do you wish to do in order to achieve the desired results? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> That's not worked at all. Right, so we can go back to annoy Colonel Firesnuff, but I don't know if that's going to help. Although we do quite easily annoy him, but that's kind of cheating. Give Aunt Primrose a pep talk. Uh, adjust the things. Uh, it strikes me that I could casually feed the peacocks the packet of all natural herbal enhancement that Glenna gave me in the boathouse this morning. <laughs> or just do nothing. Again, that's sort of cheaty. I'm not entirely sure what to do with the all natural herbal enhancement stuff. I don't really know what to do with that. I kind of felt like we should use it for the rowing. And I know I just said, oh, I don't want to do cheaty stuff. But the rowing is more important than the peacocks, I think. I think the peacocks is, you know, that's an okay thing. That's an exciting thing that's happening. But the main event of this whole sort of, uh, this whole fair is the rowing regatta race, whatever it is. So I don't think we'll do that. Um, I mean, we could, we could, let's give, oh, let's go and annoy Colonel Firesnuff. Let's try and annoy Colonel Firesnuff. And then if we annoy him enough, then that means that, you know, the judges might mark his thing down because he's being rude to them or whatever. And that's not cheating. We're just going to go and have a chat with Colonel Firesnuff. And I think we naturally just annoy him anyway. I don't think we get on. You walk over to Colonel Firesnuff, who is stroking Yasmina's shaggy fur. Does she do any tricks, you ask? Any tricks? She does every trick, scoffs Colonel Firesnuff. Do you think I'm an amateur yak shower, shower even? Yasmina and I have won scads of competitions, offer all the merit of her ability to fetch and play dead. But this is not a situation for tricks. It is about grace and beauty, qualities that Yasmina has in spades. Now, I don't think Yasmina is particularly attractive. And you are unlearned in such things, says Colonel Firesnuff, and that is why you will not judge. Your opinion does not, thankfully, matter here. Now, if you'll excuse us. Ah, bother. That didn't work at all. I think we chose the two wrong things to do there in that situation. Hmm, Colonel Firesnuff is so supremely confident that you were unable to rattle him. Indeed, you think you might have made him even more confident than before, alas. Yeah, I think it might go to... Well, I don't think the peacocks are going to win it, because we bent one of the feathers, and they're a little bit kind of, you know, a little bit grumpy. Right, the judges confer. Okay. Here we go. Let's see what's going to happen. Ladies and gentlemen, the mayor says, standing on a three-legged stool and holding his hands up for attention, if I may, we have come to a decision. The winner of this year's exotic animal show is... But I hope you are prepared for what will inevitably be your defeat, Primrose, says Colonel Firesnuff. Aunt Primrose replies with something unprintable, which is luckily drowned out by the announcement by the mayor. The winner is... Colonel Firesnuff and Yasmina the Yak. Oh no, maybe we should have tried to cheat a bit, but that's not the right thing to do. Oh dear. The scores indicate a decisive victory for Colonel Firesnuff. Ho ho ho, cries Colonel Firesnuff, accepting the blue ribbon and holding it up for all to see. Aunt Primrose's mood gets darker and darker as Colonel Firesnuff pins the blue ribbon to his chest and struts around. First place, he says to Aunt Primrose. That's what the blue represents. I shall have to make room in my collection for it. Good competition this year, Primrose. You certainly gave me a round for my money, yes, indeed. But there can be only one winner. That is the nature of life. You've won this round, says Aunt Primrose, crestfallen. But my victory at the boat race will be all the sweeter for it. If I love your confidence, says Colonel Firesnuff, laughing. Entertaining. Admirable. Misplaced. He accepts the adulation of the crowd in the centre of the mayor's grounds, while Aunt Primrose fumes. Testily, she motions for one of her attendants to return the birds of Ritonello, and men storms off. I thought you did well, considering the stiff competition, auntie, says Rory. Did well does me no good. I want that ribbon, she shouts. You did the best you could, and had fun doing it, and that's what counts, says Frankenstein. Yeah, that Aunt Primrose isn't about having fun. It's about the glory and the victory and the reputation, Frankenstein. Aunt Primrose is about to respond to this sentiment when Mopsy tugs on her sleeve. Auntie, it's time to assemble for the boat race. It's starting soon. Uh, yes, 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 says Aunt Primrose. I must address my team. Inspire them. I don't feel very inspired, I must say. Curse that fire snuff. Curse yaks. I'm terribly sorry that you say, enough of that says Aunt Primrose to you. You should have thought of that before. No, no more talking, I fear I may lose my temper. 
Uh, yeah, that didn't that didn't go at all according to plan. Never mind, you can't win them all. One hour later finds on Primrose standing in front of the crew of the big bearded Bernard. Ostensibly, she's supposed to give an inspiring speech, but her mood is far from inspiring. Just row, she says. What does it matter anyway? She says. Try your like, it all comes to naught in this veil of tears. This is entire that is the entirety of her speech, and it has a rather dampening effect on the morale of the crew of the big bearded Bernard. What do you do as everyone looks at each other uncomfortably? <laughs> so basically, she's lost all hope. Um, okay, what do we say? I shout, huzzah for Mrs. Patterson. I maintain a dignified, confident attitude. I am visibly nervous about the boat race to come. I mean, let's not do that. Let's not be nervous. Um, dignified, confident attitude. Or do we say huzzah for Mrs. Patterson and try to get everyone else to join in a kind of chorus of huzzahs? Let's go for that, shall we? Why not? Your shout rings out and echoes across the river. Then Carlington takes up the cry as well. Soon all of her staff is shouting for her and she waves away your cheers. But you can see the fire just beginning to return to her eyes. We shall prevail, they all shout. Oh yes, and I think, I think this is going to be it. This is probably, I imagine, the kind of the final big story of Tally Ho, the boat race. And you know, this has been mentioned from fairly early on, really. The boat race has been kind of a big thing that we've been building up to, but here we go. The boat race is upon us. Rowers, take your seats. The cry goes up and the crowd shivers in anticipation, looking around at the rowers as they approach their vessels, discussing who looks like they have strong arms and a hardy constitution. Banners wave and horns are tootled. That's a nice expression. Tootling a horn. Oh, that's lovely. You take your seat in the big bearded Bernard. Rory gingerly climbs into the seat nearest you. I face toward the bow, right? No. Away. Wait. Towards. Right. Do I look at you or away from you? You can see the other six members of the team doing their level best not to say something they will regret. Oh, why did we bring Rory? <laughs> Maybe that was a mistake. You face the stern of the boat. Oh, so we won't be looking at each other. That's not very good for conversation. That is just how it is, sir. Hmm. Yes, it's all coming back to me. You know, we would have certainly won last year if we'd have only gone faster. Okay, right. So yeah, I don't quite know what happened last year, but yeah, I think they went the wrong way. My memory of the event is slightly different, sir. I understand that you were inexpert in your technique, I say, in a jovial manner to make the crew of the boat laugh. That is often the way of races, sir. I say, careful to keep a neutral tone. I'm afraid I only witnessed the aftermath, sir. Of course, you told me about it in the ambulance afterwards. <laughs> the ambulance? What? I say in a sympathetic manner, although the rowers may not want to be reminded of Rory's disaster last year. Let's make the let's make the crew of the boat have a little bit of a... No, let's keep neutral. Let's keep neutral, actually, because we might possibly make the rest of the boat laugh, but then we might upset Rory. And Rory is, of course, one of our one of our rowers. And we don't want him to feel sort of silly or anything like that. We want him to feel like he's part of the team. So yes, that is often the way of races, sir. So they say, and yet I believe that we must outthink this race. Colonel Firesmith's team is indomitable. There are many ways to skin a cat cupboard. That's what I've heard. I am familiar with the expression, sir. There is one other thing, cupboard, Rory says. Something of an opportunity has come up, and I have seized it. Do you by any chance remember Surefire, that horse in the third race? The debt I incurred that, in a sense, precipitated I need to come here and make nice to Aunt Primrose, and she said she would give me the money if I helped her. Well, she was so touched that I was willing to actually row for her that she came through, gave me cash on the barrel head. 150, in fact. Real folding money, as they say. That's wonderful, sir. Yes. Oh, I can see where this is going. And then I borrowed 500 more from a very nice man I met in town named Joey Knuckles. <laughs> Never borrow money from anyone called Knuckles, Rory. Oh my goodness. And then I bet the whole thing with Chef Beauregard and Aunt Primrose to win it two to one odds. It is genius itself, you see. If I both wins, she'll be overjoyed. But how much more will she be over the moon when I hand her back her money with interest? But, sir, it's practically a sure thing, you see. That's a clever part. Two to one odds. So it is as though we're doubling our money for what is essentially a sure thing. The math of the situation is, well, it's rather complex. I don't have time to teach it to now, Cupboard. What do you think? Give the old bird half, and then we take the other half, and vacation in some sunny locale. I think you will still have to pay back the loan with interest, sir. Nah, yes, but I can do the figures, uh, figure the figures out later when I have paper, said Rory airily. Okay, so, um, I bury my face in my hands. It may amuse you to learn that I myself placed a wager on Mrs. Patterson. I will do my very best to help us win. That was a highly economically imprudent, sir. If I might offer an opinion, what if Colonel Firesniff wins? Let's just again... Keep it neutral. Let's not bring him down. 
Let's not even bring him down. He's made a bit of a... Okay, no, he's not made a bit of a mistake. He's made a huge mistake borrowing 500 money from someone called Joey Knuckles, <laughs> which is a brilliant name. Um, So let's just... Let's just try and keep his morale up. Let's not put him down at all. Because, you know, everyone makes mistakes from time to time. Rory makes quite a lot of them. Uh, I would do my very best to help us win. How can we deploy these herbal supplement thingamajigs? Um, of course you will, Cupboard. I have complete faith in you. I don't know that complete faith is wholly warranted here, you say. But I shall try. Nonsense, Rory says. After a few moments of adjusting and assorted chatter, the sturdy woman at the stern of the big bearded Bernard hollers at everyone to be quiet, she wears a pink and white polka dotted handkerchief over her hair and her powerful jaws work away at a truly massive wad of bubblegum. She pushes the wad of gum to one cheek. All right, let me say a few words here. I'm Beatrice Scrubbers. Everyone just calls me Scrubs. Most of you know me as a laundress at Ritornello, but today we're not doing laundry. Am I right? She waits to be assured loudly that she is right. Receiving this assurance, she moves on. Not doing laundry, Scrubs says again, removing the wad of gum to her the cheek. Right, now let me remind everyone how this race goes. Four legs this race. Leg number one, dead simple. Gentle waters and the crowd will be lined up cheering us. We want those cheers. Nothing less a row of spirit like cheers. An attractive, well-handled boat gets cheers. Simple as that. She had a stick of gum to her mouth and pauses for full effect. <laughs> so there's an aesthetic dimension here. I wasn't aware of that. Should we indulge in spirited hijinks to make the crowd laugh? Wouldn't it be wiser to focus solely on speed and technique? Okay. Now, do we want the crowd cheering us? Because that's going to make them like us a bit more. Like, yeah, why not? There's an aesthetic dimension. Oh, hang on there, but now I'm doubting myself. Wouldn't it be wiser to focus solely on speed and technique? Because then we can win. And winning is good. Um, let, Joe, well, let's go for that. Let's put our, we need to win this sort of head on. Because, you know, if we don't, Rory's going to be completely broken. It's all going to be terrible. So, um, yes, wouldn't it be wiser to focus solely on speed and technique? That'd be a terrible blunder, said Scrubs. The uncheered for boat will sink. Not literally, of course, but spirits will sink. To be buoyant, your mood has to be buoyant. That's how boat races work. And I've worked, as long as I've been captain of this team. I see. Now, where was I? Ah, yes. Leg two is called Dead Rowers Bend. That's a rocky rapids filled with devastatingly sharp boulders and whirling eddies. The water will froth and go white like laundry when it's stirred about with laundry soap. But we're not doing laundry, Henderson. She snaps at the youngest rower. There's more of a test of endurance. We're going to be hit. The only question is whether we can withstand the impact. I'm going to assume you will have no uh, notified Miss Patson of your next of kin. Everyone nods. Rory turns to look at you quizzically. Leg three is the most important. That's the fork. The river splits into three paths and we'll have to choose one. One of them is the safer and slower path. One of them is shorter but more dangerous. And the third one is longer and more dangerous. There's no reason to choose a third path, is that clear? There's no advantage whatsoever. <laughs> we'll decide which path we go down when we get there and see where our competition is. Finally, all three streams recombine and there's a beautiful straight stretch of the finish line. That's going to be all raw speed. Of course, crowds will be there too, cheering us on. A little extra cheering won't hurt at the end to lift our mood. I have bought a few bottles of champagne we can pass around if we win. That's that. Don't know about the other boats, but I like a nice clean race. Clean as fresh sheets. She looks around as if defying anyone to claim that you will be doing laundry today. <laughs> okay. The stage then is set for what is sure to be the race of a lifetime. The four boats line up at the starting line, their crews hooting and taunting each other. The Fire Snuff, a powerful looking boat painted with a, gig a gigantic image of the Colonel firing a hunting rifle. <laughs> so his boat is named after him and on his boat he's got a picture of himself. We have to beat that boat. We can't lose to that. Um, so yeah, the Fire Snuff starts next to the big bearded Bernard. Colonel Fire Snuff himself sits in the boat. I've decided to row myself, he says. Thought I'd teach these youngsters a thing or two. And this is my distant relation, Jabs McNabb. She's quite a rower. Twice a rower you are, I reckon. Sitting so next to Colonel Firesnuff is an impossibly powerful looking woman. Jabs looks at you briefly, then, slowly and deliberately, cracks her knuckles. I crack my knuckles back and growl a bit. I ignore her. I smile sweetly at her. Hello, Jabs. Let's do that. Let's try and completely freak her out by being overly nice. Hello, Jabs. She smiles back. She reminds you a little bit of a toad. I hope you're ready to be humiliated. I think I'm ready, you say. Get a good look at me and my bulging muscles. Our boat will be so far ahead of you, you won't get another opportunity later, Jab says. The benevolent, uh, benevolent sorry, Policeman's Association boat, the Long Arm, led by Deputy Hardcastle, pulls up to your other side. The Long Arm is decorated to look like a prison, with desolate looking prisoners clutching the bars. <laughs> <laughs> Deputy Hardcastle is rather is a rather menacing police officer with thick, greasy black hair. 
and a number of red scars crisscrossing his face, including one that sweeps across his pitted nose and over his wandering left eye. His police helmet is dented and muddy, but he sits tall in the stern of the boat, roaring police-themed chants to raise the spirit of his crew. It is probably an illusion, but you think you can smell his breath from here, redolent of chung tobacco and spicy mustard. Finally, the worshipful company of Cordwainer's boat, the Hell for Leather, slowly joins the others. Their boat is decorated with what you think is meant to be shoes, but they are rather inexpertly painted. It looks like bricks. Possibly clouds. Oh, look, the boat is signed by the artist Figaro Fairfield. Oh no, Figs has painted it. The worshipful company of Cordwainer's boat seems to be having some trouble stopping at the starting line. They go forward, then back, then forward again, and then back until they are 10 feet behind the starting line. They decide to leave well enough alone and stay there for now. Okay, so we have a 10 foot advantage over those guys already. The entire village of Woodland Centre has turned out to watch you, and people wave banners and throw paper streamers at you. The race is about to begin, but as Scrubs explained, in a very real sense, the race for garnering the adulation of the crowd is already on. How do you attempt to gain the goodwill of the villagers? Okay, right, so we need to get everyone to like us. It is most important that they appreciate the beauty of the big bearded Bernard. I suggest that we all pose in a manner befitting its barbarian and dragon decorations. I say something outrageously but perceptibly insulting about one of the other boats to make the crowd mock them, make us look superior. By long-standing tradition, only one rival boat may be tormented in such fashion. I encourage the crowd to cheer for one of the other boats. I've decided that I don't want the good with the crowd. In fact, I spurn the crowd. No, let's not do that. Don't encourage them to cheer for another boat, because that sounds like it might be counterproductive. Um, do we want to mock another boat, or do we basically say, look, we're in an amazing boat here. It's got a barbarian and a dragon on it. This is amazing. Can we have some love for our boat? I kind of feel that's what Cupboard would do. I don't think we'd go and mock somebody else's boat. I think we try and sort of hype up our own boat. Let's do that. Uh, do you all note how magnificent the barbarian and two-headed dragon is? Do you see the gleaming broadsword, and the grail on fire, and the skulls on fire, and really, all the things on fire? Yes, says Scrubs uncertainly. Well, I want us all to imagine ourselves in a war vessel, in a tale of bold adventure, just like that. Rory and I can be the two-headed dragon, and you can all be barbarians, and you there, you can be a viking of some sort, just be bold and glorious. Look like heroes of old. Got it? Go. Okay, is this going to work? On reflection, you think the problem may have been that it is difficult to properly convey the scope of a two-headed dragon and a bunch of barbarians in a boat. You also have to bump into each other. There is barbaric roaring, but it gets a bit muddled when people start stepping on each other's feet. <laughs> all in all, it is a decidedly mixed review, not really as bold and spectacular as you had hoped. It is a bitter pill to swallow, especially as Colonel Firesnuff is garnering a lot of applause by having the crowd simply yell, Firesnuff, Firesnuff. You look around to consider your strategy. You have just enough time to speak out one more time before the race begins. Okay, do you know what? Let's do this then. Let's go down the route of insulting another boat. Which boat will be the target of your barbed wit? It's got to be Fire Snuffs. It's got to be Fire Snuffs. I'm not bothered about the, the Cordwainers. Not so bothered about that. The police, I think, they're, it's, it's going to be us versus Fire Snuff, isn't it? Let's be honest. We know that's going to be the big showdown. So let's mock Fire Snuff. Let's see if we can do that. What a ridiculous painting, you say, motioning to the image of Colonel Firestuff on his boat. We all get plenty of you in real life, Colonel. Why would you believe that we all long to behold your face even more? Would it be possible to cover it? It is making me somewhat nauseated. Is that so? He says. It is. It just so happens that this boat was a gift from the Lord Mayor's brother, he says, for service rendered unto him. Valiant service, I believe, was the term he used. I don't think that anyone here appreciated your harsh words about the taste of the Lord Mayor's brother. Oh... Naturally, a modest man like me would not have commissioned such a work. Attractive though it is, doesn't everyone think so? Colonel Firesnuff raises his hands to get the crowd worked up. Fire snuff, fire snuff. The crowd dutifully responds, much to your chagrin. I think you pronounced that. Oh, bother. We're never not looked today, are we? Things are just not working today for us at all. Inspector Ambrose, in a bright yellow dinghy with an outboard motor, pulls in front of the four competitors. With him in the boat are a nondescript man and woman wearing bright yellow tunics that bear the word referee. They both look bored. Welcome to the 8 Amdurate for annual Woodland Centre boat race, he says. I, Inspector Ambrose, will be the master of ceremonies. And here, in the bright yellow boat, and wearing bright yellow shirts, are Mr and Mrs Pennywhistle, world-renowned boat race judges. I think their reputation for fairness and observation will brook no objections from anyone, he scrutinises the crowd. Before we begin, I would like to show everyone the grand prize. He motions to the massive wicker hamper in the rear of his boat. It is reinforced with steel and large enough to probably require two, pe two strong people to place it in the boat. 
He opens the top, revealing its bounty. Dozens of wedges of creamy white cheese flecked with light blue veins, jewel-like blackberries, mounds of pears, crusty bulls and batards, some with dried apricots, pepita-studded fugaces, I don't even know what that is, rosemary focaccia and soft milk-white pandemi, tubs of honey butter and pate and quince paste, sandwich after sandwich stuffed with cheeses and cured meats, jars of pickles and herbed hard-cooked eggs, jiraboms of crisp apple-kissed wines and half bottles of sweet ports and dark brown bottles of lavender ginger beer. Petit fours and truffles of every description, dark chocolate with hazelnuts, marzipan dusted with spicy cinnamon and vanilla caramel with burnt sugar. It sounds amazing. Is there any tea to go with that? Because that would make it perfect. And of course, says Inspector Ambrose, this. He notes the diamond and gold medallion within the hamper. The medallion reads, winner. You see Aunt Primrose lock eyes with Colonel Firesnuff and with Deputy Hardcastle and the Guildmaster of the Cordwainers. The picnic basket will be kept on the judge's motorbike throughout the race, where you may catch glimpses of it as you race to inspire you. That is the centuries-old tradition here in Woodland Centre. Good luck all, and see you at the finish line. You slide your hand into your pocket and touch the packet of all natural herbal enhancement you received this morning. You wonder if... Now this is the thing. Is this stuff good or is it bad? Because, you know, we paid an alright amount of money for this, I think. I would like to think it might give us a bit of a... bit of a boost. But yeah, so we can give it to the police boat. We can have it... give it to Firesnuff's crew. We could give it to the Cordwainers. We could eat it ourselves or we could just chuck it in the river. I don't know what the best thing is to do with this. Because I kind of... you know, it, half of me, a bit of me is thinking, yeah, it's fine. Give us a nice boost. It'll give us some energy. Maybe it's like, I don't know, caffeine tablets. Or something. I don't know. But yeah, it'll give us a good old boost. Whereas part of me thinks it's, you know, some sort of horrible laxative and it's going to is going to affect us in the most negative way. But I don't know. I don't know anything about this. I mean, really, what would Cupboard do in this situation with what's on the line? We know now that we have to win this race. We absolutely 100% have to win the race. Now, how can we win the race? Can we win against Colonel Firesnuff's team on our own without taking some sort of advantage? I'm not 100% sure we can. They seem quite formidable. So do we either go down this route? I mean, it's going to be either we have it or nobody has it. I'm going to give it to someone else. Um, I offer the herbs to my crew, noting they're all natural and designed for a burst of energy. I toss the packet into the river, as I suspect using them would be cheating. I mean, they are all natural, apparently. So we've been told. And they are from Mopsy. And Mopsy wouldn't want us to fail, I don't think. I think Mopsy would want us to do well. Because we like Mopsy and Mopsy likes us and such like. Do you know what? Let's go for it. I mean, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's all part of the rich tapestry of Tally Ho. Let's have some herbs to our crew. There we go. Hey, everyone. Here, try this, you say, handing Scrubs the packet of spices. Oh, no. Is that Glenna's nonsense? All right, all right. Don't wave it round, Scrubs says, winking at you. And Bongo Spice, right? And a number of other all-natural spices, yes. Scrubs divvies up the spices among the crew. You take a taste. It is compelling. You feel confident and energetic, and Rory has to hold you down so you don't run straight off the boat. Yes, you can do this. The bag of herbs and spices should have a strong, long-lasting effect, perhaps long-lasting enough to tip the race. Inspector Ambrose raises a flag and then waves it dramatically. Row, he shouts. You will bend to your oars and begin to row. We're off, Rory says, and what a lovely day for it, and for winning a great deal of money. Okay, right. Here's a straightaway, shouts Scrubs too. Now I'm supposed to be in charge here, always been, but Mrs. Patterson told me just before just before that I'm supposed to listen to you if you have any bright ideas. I don't know what that's all about, but here we are. So, any bright ideas? Okay, do we focus mainly on raw speed? Do we take it a bit slow and leisurely, or do we attempt to ram into another boat to damage and confuse them? I don't think where we are now, we should ram into boats because we're in the first leg. Everyone can see this and that might be frowned upon, particularly if we start trying to destroy the boat that was given to them by the mayor or whatever it was. So, um, so yeah, let's... How about we take it easy for now? Ta no, hmm, do we want to focus on raw speed or do we want to take it easy? We're not going to ram into anyone's boat. Do we take it easy to conserve our strength and then later on, maybe at the end, absolutely go for it? and hope that Colonel Firesnuff and the others have kind of, you know, used up their energy, and then we can come through at the end. Maybe that's what we do. Conserve our strength. That's absolutely what we do. It may be a race, but what is a race anyway? In a sense, life is a race, you say. Easy on those oars. Slow is the name of the game. I presume you are familiar with the fable of the tortoise and the hare. The tortoise, to my way of thinking, had the right idea. Are you quite sure? Scrubs demands. 
Rather, you say, you row slowly. It is a beautiful day. A dragonfly lights on your hand, lingers for a long moment, and then departs. I mean, I don't mean have a leisurely stroll like we're, <laughs> like we're sightseeing. Just don't go completely hell for leather. Just, you know, be a little bit calm. You and the crew of the big bearded burner come out of the straightaway in first place, and Scrubs roars her approval. Colonel Firesnuff is in second place, hot on the tail of the big bearded Bernard, and he yells to you that he is only lulling you into a false sense of security. The Cordwainers are in third place. Oh, okay. One of them shouts that this is the best they've ever done, and they consider this a great victory no matter the final result. Finally, we come to the police boat bringing up the rear. Deputy Hardcastle has already evicted one of his rowers from the boat in a peak, and seems very likely to capsize the police boat with his stomping and raging. <laughs> okay. We're in Dead Rowers Bend, announced Scrubs. Okay, so that's the second bit. Um, but that much is obvious. The churning rapids and the hidden boulders that comprise these rapids make an alarming and near-deafening whoosh. The Big Bernard goes up and down, up and down, and passes terribly close to sharp, jagged cliff faces on either side of the narrow, twisty pass. The choice here is a stark one. Is it better to prioritise safety over all else, even though that means dropping your speed, or to head pell-mell forward, seeking to go as fast as possible without a thought to safety? Or would it be wiser to attempt to drive one of your opponents onto the rocks, possibly damaging their boat, but also maybe your own? Perhaps wiser is not quite the right word for such a strategy, though. Okay, I think, again, this is tricky. This is horrible. And if we have a hole in the boat and we sink, that is it. Game over. So if we get through this, we're still in the race. So I think we go for safety. So I tell Scrubs that speed is important, even if we get banged up. I implore Scrubs to give the most thought to safety, weaving carefully between the most treacherous regions. I instruct the crew to row. So should we drive Colonel Firesoft onto the rocks? Okay, so that means we just drive people into rocks. I'm not really feeling that. Let's go nice and safe. And the next two legs, so leg three and four, will go yeah, absolutely crazy and just really go for it. Let's take it as slow as we need to, to ensure that we don't get banged up, you say. If you say so, says Scrubs. I mean, aye, aye. You and the crew slow a bit to weave around a collection of jagged boulders that appear to be smashing together in the middle of the river of their own accord. Rather than, uh, than chance dodging between them, you go around them. It may not be heroic, but neither is being bludgeoned to death. Quite, so that's my logic there. That's my logic. If we'd have gone in there at top speed and destroyed the boat, that'd be it. We'd all be, you know, a bit dead. But now we're still in the race. You stop rowing and help Scrubs observe the pattern of boulder movement, while at the same time keeping clear of the sharp cliff faces on either side of you. Duck! Now! You command. Lean left. Everyone leap in the air. Full stop. Now row as hard as you can for five seconds. There! Several minutes of that sort of nail-biting intensity follow. The crew cheers as you make it out of the rapids practically unscathed in reasonable time. The boat and the crew are none the worse for wear. Rory looks a bit greenish, though. Perhaps Rory is slightly the worse of where... Oh, no. We've lost Rory. He might be feeling a little bit sort of uh, boat sick. Okay, that's fine, though. That's fine. Now we're coming up to the third bit. The big bearded Bernard is in the lead as you emerge from the horrors of dead Rower's Bend. Never again, you think. Colonel Firesnuff is in second place, and he whispers silent prayers to every divinity he can think of, including several buried and eldritch gods of the sea, to give his team the strength to win. The Cordwainers are in third place, doggedly attempting to catch up, but still terribly shaken by their narrow escape from Dead Rowers Bend. Bring up the rear is the police boat. The long arm is terribly scratched and dented, and seems to have an almost 90 degree bend at the bow. Several officers' oars have also broken, so they make do with their billy clubs. <laughs> this is wonderful. This is so ludicrously farcical. It's brilliant. Ahead of you lie, uh, lie two large islands in the centre of a majestic river, which serves to divide the river into three parts. Puttering around this area is the small bright yellow motorboat with Mr and Mrs Pennywhistle, the ostensible referees, and the prize basket. The two referees observe you briefly and without any interest. As you approach, they then continue to play cards. Remember, Scrub says, the left path is safer and slower. Calm water's there. The middle path is shorter, but more dangerous. They said the middle path is the turf of a gang of orphans who defend their territory ferociously, and I have never braved it. Many rowers went to the middle path, never emerge or emerge changed. And I would advise ignoring the third one altogether. It is almost completely pointless. It is much longer and more dangerous. Let me reiterate, there is no reason to choose the third path. Okay, you look around at your opposition. Colonel Firesnuff is heading for the left path, clearly hoping that a safer route will prove decisive. Deputy Hardcastle orders a police boat to the middle fork, hoping to gamble on the shorter path and the Cordwain is defying all reason, head for the right path. We'll have to decide in a minute or so, Scrub says, almost unintelligibly through a billiard ball-sized chunk of bubblegum. You're supposed to know things. What do you suggest? It is very precisely at this moment that Rory turns to you and says, Oh, dear cupboard, I'm afraid I don't... I don't feel very... Okay, 
I don't care if I have to make a crucial decision. Rory is ill and I'm going to wholly tend to him and leave the decision to Scrubs. I direct one of the crew to care for Rory while I consider which fork to take in this critical moment. I do my best to verbally comfort Rory with slightly less than half of my attention while I decide what fork to take. Now get somebody else to look after Rory. Because, you know, we're still kind of there. We can still lean over and give him a friendly pat on the shoulder or whatever. And we shall consider what fork to take. You. You point to one of the crew at random as you consider. Help him say comforting things. That matter taken care of, you take a long moment to observe the three routes and to weigh your options carefully. After a moment, the answer comes to you. We're going to... Oh, no. <laughs> Again, I don't know. I don't know what the right thing is to do. Um, this This is certainly very suspicious. The right path is certainly... You know, alarm bells are ringing when they mention this. Because they keep saying, Ah, oh, yeah, we definitely don't want to go down the right path. Absolutely. Let's not go down there at all. That would be silly. But but why is it there otherwise? But then we could find out that it's completely horrendous and long and dangerous. And, you know, we shouldn't have gone down it. And everyone told us that. Centre path is shorter but more dangerous. Do you know what? Safer. Let's go down the fire snuff route. He's going down that route. We shall also go down that route. We're going to the left path. Left path, aye, shout the crew. Rory's draped over the side of the boat, head hanging over the side of retching, with one of the crew roughly saying, there we go, there we go, all right now, and slapping him on the back. Rory sits back up and looks at you with a hint of dismay and rue. That was ghastly covered. Feeling better now, sir? I am. We are heading to the left fork. It should be smoother waters. Thank goodness for that. Rory makes a move as if to say something else to you, but decides against it and slowly picks up his oar again. The big bearded Bernard makes it into the left fork ahead of the fire snuff. They are right behind you and closing the distance fast. Serene, languid willows droop into the water and a few frogs blurp at you from lily pads, but the calmness of the river is shattered by Colonel Firesnuff. I'm coming for you, coward, he bellows. We're just hitting our stride, boasts Colonel Firesnuff. Up to this point, we've been merely relaxing. For every stroke you can do, we can do seven in the same time if we had a mind to, follows Colonel Firesnuff. Thanks to my secret weapon, Jabs McNabb. Look at those biceps, look at those triceps, look at those quadriceps and her quinteceps. Massive, bigger than your head. <laughs> All right, we get it. The big bearded Bernard skims over the water, propelled by sheer irritation and the desire to show Colonel Firesnuff a thing or two, but you are unable to shake him, and slowly the Firesnuff pulls alongside the big bearded Bernard. Ha! He says, glory and victory are at hand. You both row, right next to each other, for several minutes, neither of you giving quarter. Rory strains at the oar, and Scrubs works away on both her gum and oar with equal vigour. It seems as though it will be a race for the ages. <gasps> when suddenly... Hang, can we not use our sort of energy from our things now? Um, Surprise boarding action! cries Colonel Firesnuff. Hooks out! What? He's cheating? <gasps> Cheaty cheat man! The crew of the Firesnuff lift their oars, revealing oddly shaped barbs at the end of them, which they use to hook onto the side of the big bearded Bernard and pull it into direct contact with the Firesnuff. Then all is chaos, as some of Firesnuff's rowers swarm onto the big bearded Bernard and engage you <laughs> in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Right. I wasn't expecting this. Uh, Jabs McNabb wielding an oar, which is a brilliant name for this particular thing. Jabs McNabb wielding an oar in both hands like a quarterstaff has four scrubs to the very edge of the boat while Colonel Firesnuff looks on, shouting commands from the Firesnuff, such as right flank advance and reinforcements. Meanwhile, Rory tries to separate the big bearded Bernard from the Firesnuff while fending off shoves from Firesnuff's crew. What would be the most important thing for you to do in this most desperate battle for naval supremacy? Okay. <laughs> right. We can either... Fight Colonel Firesnuff, which does seem like the appropriate thing to do, doesn't it? Ever since we met him, he's not liked us. We've not liked him. I think that would be a showdown for the ages. Um, shout for the intervention of the referees. They won't care because they're bored and playing cards. Jabs McNabb is mine. I challenge her to single combat. Um, I think let's go and fight Colonel Firesnuff. I think that is the appropriate thing to do. The final showdown between, you know, two... Is enemies too strong a word? Two people who really don't like each other. There we go. You leap over to the fire snuff and go over to Colonel Fire Snuff, who is having a marvellous time directing his boarding action. Then what? I remind him that the only ones who stand to gain from this skirmish are the police and the cordwainers. I stand next to him and consider the battle, analysing the battle from a tactical point of view, which will keep the big bearded burner and the fire snuff locked in combat here for as long as possible. I tell him that if he doesn't calm down and call off his, uh, call off his rows, I will push him into the river. <laughs> I mean, I will gladly push him in. Absolutely, I'll gladly push him in. Um, yeah. Do we go down a sort of... I don't think he'll care about this. If we say the only ones to gain are the police and the cordwainers, he's going to go, rah, bluff and bluster, and kind of not really care. Um, I stand next to him, consider the battle. Analyzing the battle from a tactical point of view. 
So that's going to keep them locked in combat here for as long as possible. Do we want them to do that? Do we want them to be locked together for as long as possible? I don't know if we do. Or do we? But then I don't think he's going to do that, is he? I don't think. If we say, if you don't calm down and call throws, I'm going to push you in the river. I think he's just going to tell us to clear off. We're very clever. Cupboard is very brainy. Cupboard likes a lot of sort of tactical things. Let's go down this. Let us consider the battle and analyse it from a tactical point of view. You stand next to Colonel Firesnuff and clasp your hands behind your back, observing the back and forth of the battle next to him. Colonel Firesnuff takes a cigar out of his pocket and begins to go through the ritual of cutting and lighting it. That jabs... Hang on, who's saying that? Um, that's him. That jabs McNabb is quite a force of nature, isn't she? Note how she's able to lift your crewman clear above her head. Naval combat is such a fascinating field. I probably would have become an admiral if I had not such an affinity for land combat. It seems rather difficult to engage in such close fighting on an unsteady boat. Difficult to get a good, difficult to get a good swing without falling, you point out. Well, for some, perhaps. Not for a crack crew trained by a master tactician. I refer, of course, to me. My boat crew drills weekly in close fighting manoeuvres. That is why my crew is giving your crew such a walloping. He smokes in silence for a moment. Then he gestures with his cigar toward Willington, one of your smaller crew members. I don't much care for your crew. They are weedy, ill-equipped for the finer points of hand turn combat. Well, we thought we were going to be rowing, not battling. Oh, that is where you made your fatal blunder. Everything can turn into a battle. There, look at him. What do you think of his technique? Okay, I like how he used champagne bottles to blind his foe. <laughs> I like how he's attempting to create a flanking movement to jabs his side. Interesting how he managed to secure that picnic basket to an oar with a bit of rope to create a makeshift flail. Let's go for a flanking movement to Jabs's side, where we can push Jabs in or something. Is that what you call it? I call it attempting to retreat. One can hardly retreat on a small boat, you note. He is trying to, said Colonel Firesnuff, shaking his head. No courage at all. Finally, Colonel Firesnuff finishes his cigar and tosses it into the river. Fine talking to your cupboard. You don't know anything about military tactics, but you'll try. I suppose that is worth something. On reflection, this battle is so desperately one-sided that I am calling a halt to it at once. Educate yourself, cupboard. I can recommend a number of excellent books. Back, everyone. Take your seats. Row. Okay, so just a bit of fisticuffs, but we talked to him. Yeah, we talked to him on a topic that he liked. We made him feel important, and now he's kind of called it off. Okay, you hop back to the big bearded Bernard as your crew regain their seats. We almost had him, cries Scrubs. Rory touches his head lightly. I think I shall have a bump as large as an ostrich egg. That was a nasty blow you sustained. To tackle Jab single-handedly, like that well, it was daring, sir. I thought I could strike unexpectedly, but I didn't expect that life preserver to come into play. She wielded that thing like a discus, didn't she? It bounced right off your head. I've no idea where it's ended up, you say, looking around. Oh, the moon, I expect, says Rory. Nevertheless, I seem to have recovered most of my intellectual capabilities. Thank you for getting Colonel Firesnuff to call the whole thing off. Clever. Cut the head off the snake, as they say. Yes, that is exactly what I was doing. It wasn't really. I didn't know what to do. You start rowing again and find that the half-finished battle has got your crew's blood pumping and inspires them with the strong desire to beat Colonel Firesnuff. Faster than ever, you skim over the surface of the river, hurtling toward the finish line. This is very exciting. The final stretch of the race. The three forks are joined back together and the four boats vie for supremacy, battling for position as you approach the finish line where the crowd stretches, shouting and tooting little horns. The big bearded Bernard emerges from the forks in the lead. Scrubs whoops and tells you that she'll never doubt you again, and then adds about 60 more pieces of gum to her mouth. <laughs> Colonel Firesnuff leaves the left fork in second place, and whips the side of the Firesnuff as if it were a bulky horse. Move, move, he shouts. The Cordwain is in third place, rowing almost in slow motion. They're covered with purple dust, and they sneeze frequently. Sometimes you think their oars are not touching the water at all, but that might just be an optical illusion. What's that about? The police boat emerges from the middle fork in last place, their boat limping along, filled with bread and what looks like raw dough. What? <laughs> what on earth happened there? The boat is falling apart and most of the police are missing their helmets. They bail the bread out of their boat desperately, but Deputy Hardcastle rows with manic intensity. I could still win, he roars. The finish line, a golden string with flags on it, is right there in front of you, and the screams, music and colours are intoxicating. Aunt Primrose, clearly audible above the crowd, screams out, The big bearded Bernard! The big bearded Bernard! And nearly throttles Mopsy in her excitement as she jumps up and down. There is just time for one more manoeuvre. After sizing up the situation carefully, you tell your crew, OK, to make for the finish line with the best possible speed, to soak in the adulation of the crowd, showboating a bit for them and encouraging their cheers. No, something that will sabotage our progress, although this may be noticeable if I'm not devious about it. No, we don't want to sabotage our own progress. No, we want to win, don't we? No, that's a terrible idea. Um, let's not showboat. Let's just row. Row, row, row your boat as fast as we can. 
Charge straight for the finish line, you come. No distractions. Ignore the adoring crowd. Forward! Yes, shouts Scrubs. Onwards, full steam. Oars flying. The big bearded Bernard makes a supreme final effort at tremendous speed. Photographers snap pictures furiously. Sandwiches pause midway to mouths, and people crowd forward to see the moment of victory. And the winner is... The big bearded Bernard! Woohoo! We did it! <laughs> I genuinely thought that wasn't going to work. Oh my goodness me. Hello! Cries Aunt Primrose, ripping off her hat and tossing it into the air. She dances a jig on the side of the river and points to Colonel Firesnuff, who looks absolutely flabbergasted. Good word. Take that! I've done it! I've won! Me! Colonel Firesnuff comes in in second place, missing the victory by just a few seconds. The police are in third place, and the cord winners limp over the line in last place. Ah, oh, they finished at the end. A few moments later, the four boats have docked, and the rowers begin to disembark. Never before has a boat been so full of wearied souls. Good God, you've done it! You've really done it! screams Aunt Primrose, grasping you from behind and jumping up and down with you. She showers all manner of praise on you at the highest possible volume, directly into your ear for several minutes, leaving no spaces between sentences or even words. She then grabs Scrubs and pumps her hand vigorously until you begin to fear for the laundress's shoulder. And Rory, my word, she says, you've really changed my mind. What a wonder. What a miraculous transformation. I take back every miserable thing I've ever said about you, some of it dating back as recently as five minutes ago. <laughs> oh dear. Chef Beauregard, holding his flower-covered portfolio, appears before you like a phantasm. It is to be giving the congratulations, he says. A clever wager. He double-checks his portfolio, nods once, and then hands you your winnings. Very good, he says, laughing. You tell your friends about me. Maybe don't give them tips, though, or you're bankrupt, poor Beauregard. You are too clever at the betting. Au revoir, he says, and walks off to pay off other wagers. Rory comes running over to you, laughing and clutching a handful of bills. Twelve hundred, cupboard, twelve hundred! Rory is laughing. Did you even believe the numbers could go so high, cupboard? I've already given Auntie several hundred regarding Shawfire in the third race, and I've paid back that nice Mr. Joey Knuckles. You were right, he did want interest, but even so, that left me with hundreds and hundreds. Oh, Auntie was over the moon as expected. Here you are, cupboard. Hold on to most of that for me, would you? What a world where you can get just free money for no effort at all. <laughs> I'm going to buy a refreshing beverage, and I'm going to get the largest size and perhaps a commemorative mug to boot. Oh, it sounds very lovely, Rory. Can I have one, please? The penny whistles put her over to the finish line in their bright yellow motorboat. The giant picnic basket in the rear of the boat. They hold the basket up off the boat with some help and place it down next to Inspector Ambrose. Inspector Ambrose applauds everyone and gives a little speech that nobody can hear over the cheers and whistles. And now, the grand prize he says, opening the biscuit, ba uh, biscuit, the biscuit barrel, the picnic basket, that's the words I'm looking for, with a flourish. A highly festive Aunt Primrose accepts the gold and diamond winner medallion and holds it up in front of the crowd to loud adulation and cheers. At long last, she says, I hold the fruits of boat racing victory. She puts the medallion on and turns around so that everyone can appreciate it, especially Colonel Firesnuff, of course. As everyone starts milling around and preparing to go, Mopsy suddenly tugs on your arm. Cupboard, she says. This is a perfect opportunity for me to ask permission to get married to Figs right here and right now. How should I do it? It would be ever so romantic. Should I just blurt it out? Should I act coy? Okay, ask permission in a polite and mild way. Be bold, Mopsy, follow your heart. Are you quite, quite sure that Figs is your perfect spouse? Do you know what? They, she, we'll, let, we'll let her go for this. She seems like, she seems passionate. She's a passionate person who, you know, she's got a heart on her sleeve. So follow your heart, Mopsy. I shall, she says. I've been meek and trammelled upon so far, but now I will be unrestrained. Thank you, cupboard. I thought as much, but I like to ask advice that tells me what I already think. It tends to confirm my wonderful thoughts for me. Best of luck, you say. She runs over to a nearby ring toss stand where Figs is flinging some rings in a melancholy fashion, watching Mopsy talk to you. Then she takes Figs by the hand and together they walk up to Aunt Primrose and speak to her. You are close enough to see them, but not hear them. First you see Aunt Primrose guffaw, and then stomp her foot a few times. Then she shakes her fist a few times at Figs. You take that as a sign that things are not going very well. Eventually, she shakes her head in a clear and emphatic no. Mopsy screams at Aunt Primrose, then runs over to you crying. She said not now, Mopsy balls, burying her head in you. Not right now means never. Okay. Right, so that didn't work. Again, many things we've tried this time around haven't entirely worked according to plan. Mopsy, you must be patient and obedient. Your aunt is trying to protect you. You must respect that and be a good niece. Why don't you act instead of crying about it? I hold her and comfort her. Okay, hang on. You must be patient and obedient. Your aunt is trying to protect you. Mm, but I, she's not going to be happy, is she? Um, why don't you act instead of crying about it? Let's just hold and comfort her. Let's just be nice. 
you let her cry on for a while and then you take her where she can have a bit more privacy and she cries and cries until she cannot cry anymore. I was waiting for today, she goes. I did everything, everything to make it happen and nothing went right, nothing. You just hold her. There's no need for words at a time like this. It's never going to change ever. Aunt Primrose hates him and she won't listen to me. Nobody loves me except for figs. But you hold her and let her know that this isn't true. Finally, the last tear is out and she inhales and she pulls away slowly. Thank you, cupboard, she whispers. I know you love figs too and you love me. I guess that's got to be enough for me. Maybe I'll just go tell Auntie I'm sorry. I have to live in that house. I don't like fighting. Not too much. She walks away slowly. Oh, that's all a bit sad. Poor Mopsy. People start to walk away from the river, drifting in pairs and small groups to the village centre for the grand luncheon, dancing a pie tasting. That sounds amazing. And then later on as evening falls, fireworks. A horse-drawn cart filled with bales of hay pulls up and stops near Aunt Primrose. Gather round, everyone. I've ordered a special treat for us, says Aunt Primrose. This is an American-style harvest celebration. It is called a hayride. Rory stands next to Frankincense, chatting about the boat race. Mopsy lingers near to Rory, lost in thought. Figs has drifted off over past the several uh, over the past several minutes. It seems that he will not be going on the hayride. Everyone who's coming, let's go, shouts Aunt Primrose. Aunt Primrose and the others pause in arranging themselves in the haystacks of the cart to enjoy a performance of the strolling glee and handbell performers, who pause by the hay cart to perform a rollicking performance of Alexander's ragtime band. <laughs> Sounds amazing. Ah, covered, says Rory. Say, before the hayride, just a quick question. A bit of a juicy one, actually, sir. Uh, well, it's like this. I think we've established that uh, that we care for each other more than in the everyday sense, if you take my point. No sense beating around the bush between you and me. No, sir. So when we get home, things will be dif a bit different between us, I'm thinking. And I like that notion. I like it a good deal. But it struck me that you might have thought about it a bit and decided, no, no, Rory is my employer. And this has all been a passing whim or a delusion of some sort. And that you would like us to just continue as normal. Rory bites his lower lip. Okay, so, sir, I'm head over heels in love with you, and that is final. Thank you for saying that, sir, and due consideration. I think I think it's best for us if we resume our usual employer and employee relationship. No, all the work we've put in. Are you afraid of what people will say? No, let's just be honest. Go, head over heels in love with you, and that is final. Oh, cupboard, shouts Rory. I mean, oh, cupboard, he says again, much more quietly. You make me very happy. That has always been my goal, you say, whether as your valet or... As my love, says Rory, finishing your sentence. I'm the biggest fool in the world not to have seen how wonderful you are before this. How did you deal with my blindness? Do you want me to crack do you want to crack me over the head with a Ming vase at times? Okay, I don't know if I ever wanted to smash him over the head with a vase. I mean sometimes he did blunder about the place and make a few, you know, errors here and there. Every single day, so it doesn't matter. There were a few moments, not too many times, less than half a dozen, or never, sir. There were a few moments. There were a few moments where I wanted to knock some sense into Rory, I am sure. Oh, that's not bad, says Rory. I am slow, but I get there in the end. Now, let us sit next to each other and enjoy a hayride together, savouring the future to come. As you're about to step onto the haycart behind Rory and Frankincense, Regina taps your shoulder. Almighty oh, teapot. Regina leans over to you, holding out a clipboard for you to see. It almost makes no sense to you, a morass of circled numbers and graphs, but you can see one word on top, written in red ink and underlined twice, denied. Most unfortunate, says Regina. Not surprising, though. 95% of potential recruits do not make it past the test. Do not feel bad, almighty teapot, or, as I suppose I can just call you now, cupboard. You're still a valuable member of the cabaret club, just not inner circle potential, I'm afraid. Speak of us to nobody. And good luck in all of your future endeavours. She turns to get on the hay cart, as Aunt Primrose hollers for you to both get on already. That's fine. Not really so bothered about that. I mean, you know, maybe if we were to play this again, do it a different way, then maybe we could try and do that. But this time round, whatever, not bothered. Carlington and Scrubs heave the huge prize basket of delicious fancy foods onto the cart, where it takes up almost two seats, making the cart sag a bit. I can't wait for luncheon, says Aunt Primrose, and we have all of this bounty here. Let's eat right here in the cart. As she passes around the dainties from the basket, she sees Colonel Firesnuff watching from the street. Get up on here, Firesnuff, she growls. There's a massive apricot marzipan pie that I need your help to eat. You want to share me to share with you, he says. Yes, I do. You have annoyed me a good deal. You are insufferable, but you are part of this family and you are not going to walk when I have a hay cart and a basket of food. Sit next to me and don't tell me any of your stories. Ah, <laughs> oh, they've sort of got this amicable peace. That's nice. Colonel Firestuff climbs onto the hay cart with great speed, except to a sandwich and a deviled egg from Aunt Primrose. He starts to say something about himself and then stops. Thank you, Primrose, he says. That is all. Then, astonishingly, he says nothing else for five whole minutes in a row. <laughs> wow. A few moments later, 
uh, finds you out on the hay cart, bumping along the road to the village green. Rory, next to you, takes a big bite out of a linzer tort, laughs at something Aunt Primrose has said, and touches her arm lightly, affectionately, happily. Aunt Primrose makes a witty comment and slaps her own knee in appreciation of her own joke. She tosses several truffles in her mouth and exclaims with a full mouth, No, that's a fine chocolate! Colonel Firesnuff taps on one of his sideburns thoughtfully, preparing a lengthy rejoinder to something political that Frankincense has said. He takes a long quaff of red wine and examines the label with a critical eye. Mopsy sits a bit apart, subdued, talking lightly of this and that, but without her usual spirit. She does her best to respond when Aunt Primrose tells her to sit up straight, but she is clearly longing for her figs. She looks up at the trees and sighs and waits. Oh, that's all a bit sad. You close your eyes for a moment. Ooh. Crikey, there's a lot of options. We can't seem to do many of them. You close your eyes for a moment. Somehow, this particular adventure seems different, or feels different from the dozens and dozens of other adventures you've had with Rory. The affair at the ski lodge, for example, or the month you spent with his other more dastardly relation, Aunt Thistle, on an excruciating holiday in Penzance. <laughs> you wonder what comes next for you. As you rest your eyes, you can see your future unfolding before you. Oh. So depending on all the choices we've made, this could have been, all these things could have been lit up. So we could, but we can't have done most of these things. So we could have, but not um, written to Regina Teller, I'm going to accept the invitation to join the Inner Circle. Um, okay, we can go and get another job. Aunt Primrose can get us another job. Okay, one with a title. Um, I'm going to serve Rory and Frankincense as I start their new life together. Work with Frankincense in politics. Going to become a notorious criminal. The notion of acting is enticing to me. Or... The option we've got. I'm not quite certain what I want to do. I am going to have to think about it. Perhaps someday soon you will know. But all you want to do now is rest a bit and clear your head. The countryside rolls past as you make merry, laugh a good deal and argue about the day. There are fireworks planned for the evening after the mayor's speech and the costume party, but no fireworks could possibly hope to compete with the dazzlingly fiery orange, yellow, plum, purple and red gold of the trees of Woodland Centre. Rory leans into a bit more. Of all the trips we've ever been on cupboard, this has been the very best. We've had more relaxing ones, certainly, and there has been a good deal of hardship, but I know just what you mean, Rory. It makes one think about life and good and ill and the strange nature of fate and how a story can all be wrapped up, uh, can be all wrapped about with happy things and sad things. Rather deep, don't you think? Rory looks at you joyfully. You take Rory's hand. As you say, sir, as you say. And then it's the next chapter. And I think that's kind of it. That's the main thing done. Then we have epilogue. We're at the epilogue. Breakfast in bed. Oh my goodness me. So the story is finished and it got wrapped up okay. I think the only person that was, I mean, we don't know what happened to Maze. We don't really know what happened to Maze. The only person that kind of came out of that not with a properly happy ending, I guess, was, um, was Mopsy. She seemed a little bit sad, but you know, everyone else sort of seemed okay. And now we have the epilogue, which is called Breakfast in Bed. Okay, that sounds wonderful. I love Breakfast in Bed. Okay, right, well, here we go to the epilogue of Tally Ho. Rise and shine, Penge, calls Rory. It's very odd when he calls us Penge. I prefer cupboard, but there we go. Rise and shine, Penge, calls Rory. Rouse yourself and prepare to be dazzled. A muffled crash emerges from the kitchen. It's all right, no problems at all. The flower crock did not fall over. Rory's assurance is immediately followed by an acrid smell and a low thud. Oh my goodness me, is Rory in the kitchen? Okay, this could be a disaster. You sit up in bed as Rory nudges the door open, bearing a tray with a bowl of oatmeal and a plate with a stack of pancakes, a generous rasher of bacon and a cup of steaming tea. That sounds wonderful. Oh, Rory, you know the way to my heart. Now, before you partake, says Rory, a few cautionary notes are in order. I was going to make a Harvest Spice style pancake with berries, but I forgot to add a few of what I would call critical ingredients. You may not be able to tell, but let me just say that when one is not looking, one can easily mistake the cinnamon with the cumin. Oh no. <laughs> oh, these are going to be unpleasant. It's that initial C that got me, I think. In effect, I made some substitutions. Not quite all of them voluntary. So when I realised that the pancakes were going to be uh, unusual, I decided to make oatmeal as a backup. It came out a trifle thin, though, no matter how much water I added. So I just put in some of the leftover pancake batter, and that seemed to thicken it up a bit. <laughs> so the oatmeal may taste strongly of cumin as well, unfortunately. The tea should be fine, though, and the other bits and bobs. All in all, I would evaluate myself at a solid 75 to 80 percent, which I would have been delighted about on many an exam back at school. So I hope you two will be delighted. I mean, as long as the tea is OK, as long as the tea is fine, that's the important thing. OK. So what do we do? I thank Rory and prepare to consume the results of his labour, even though it may kill me here and now. <laughs> 
Thank you, Rory. However, I took the liberty of ordering breakfast for us uh, from the cafe down the street. Ah, that should be them delivering it to us. I believe I hear them at the door. Or I raise my eyebrow ever so slightly. Um, no, let's make sure we have a lovely breakfast. I'm sure Rory has done very well indeed, but I don't really fancy oatmeal that uh, that tastes strongly of cumin and all that kind of stuff. So let's just order something from uh, from the cafe down the road or whatever. There we go. Oh, thank merciful heaven, Rory says, lifting off the tea and putting the tray on the floor. Then he throws a blanket over it. Rory hands you a tea and goes to pay the fellow and then brings you in a lovely meal of croissants, eggs benedict and fruit salad. You serve Rory and you a hearty breakfast. You always know, Penge. I don't know how you know, but you know. My pleasure, Rory. Oh, it's Penge and Rory. It's no longer sort of cupboard and sir. Oh, crikeys. You've made me breakfast in bed thousands and thousands of times, Rory says. I'd like to start returning the favour. Well, that was my job at the time, you note. I did receive wages. Uh, we both know that your attentions to me went well beyond wages, Penge. I don't know how I managed to find someone like you to... Dot, dot, dot. The doorbell rings and Rory starts. Oh, good gravy. Today isn't Thursday, is it? It is, you say. Rory jumps up from the bed, pausing to kiss you. Get us in a hurry. Throw on your casuals. This is a bit awkward, Pen, so I've been putting off telling you, but... Another ring at the bell. Firm, yet genteel. Rory opens the door, revealing a sober gentleman in his late thirties with a sensible haircut, wearing a simple charcoal grey suit of fine fabric and conservative cut. Good morning, he says crisply. I am Mr. Desmond Snood. You see, Penge... Rory says nervously. I thought now that things had changed between us, we would do well to have someone to take care of the various small things that a servant take care, takes care of. I suppose I was reluctant to mention it to you because I somehow thought that you would be unhappy. I'm sorry. <gasps> Mr. Desmond Snoot, he is now our new servant. He's the new gentleman's gentleman. The gentleman's gentleman. Oh my goodness. Mr. Desmond Snoot. It's a good name. It's a great name. Okay, so what can we say? Uh, Rory, I will take care of everything as before. There is no need for us to hire someone new. Perhaps we might do the various household tasks together. Well, I suppose that since Mr. Snood is here, we may as well give him an interview. Oh, oh, now what do we do? I mean, are we happy with him pottering about the place, interfering in our affairs? But it might be quite handy. It might be quite handy that somebody else is there. Do you know what? Seeing as he's here, we might as well give him an interview. Uh, Thank you for understanding, Rory says, guiding Mr. Snood to a chair. Tea is offered, of course, as is the way, and declined. What? No. No. Okay, no, this guy, we're not hiring him. If he's declining tea, there's something wrong with him. That's not good. As are pancakes, that's probably a wiser decision. Rory sits down at the piano bench, and you sit next to him, thinking of your own interview long ago. Now, I had your fine letter that you sent uh, sent just here a moment ago, Rory says. While he pats at his pockets fruitlessly, you look Snoot in the eye and ask him the single question that will tell you whether Snood is the person for the job. You ask a question about shoes, peacocks, the poetry of John Milton. <laughs> um, I was kind of hoping we might, might be able to ask a question about tea. Um, let's ask him about shoes. Shoes are important for, you know, a gentleman. You need to have lovely brogues on. Um, I mean, peacocks would be quite funny because, of course, we have history with peacocks, as we've just seen. Uh, the poetry of John Milton. That does keep cropping up, doesn't it? The poetry of John Milton. It does keep popping up. Why don't we ask him a question about the poetry of John Milton? I mean, I know nothing myself about the poetry of John Milton. I haven't got a clue, but let's ask this chap. Um, what would you do if, God forbid, your employer misquoted a passage from Paradise Lost? Ah, says Snood gravely, shall we assume for purposes of this discussion that the employer misquoted a piece of verse just this one time or as part of a regular programme of misquotation? Let us assume it's a regular, a part of a regular practice. I see. In that case, I would clear my throat meaningfully and supply the correct line in a low, respectful tone. And if her employer insisted that his whimsical rendition was not a misquotation, but indeed an improvement superior to the true and original copy, what then, you ask? May I have an aspirin and a glass of water, says Snood. Ah, thank you. Well, in that case, I suppose I would first say, hmm, then I would give notice. Rory gives you and Snood a quizzical look. Thank you, Snood, you say. Ah, yes, ah, very good. Uh, I thought of another question. Do you have any bad qualities that we ought to be aware of? Hang on, who's saying this? Is that me or Rory saying that? That might be Rory. Yes, very good. Ah, I thought of another question. Do you have any bad qualities that we ought to be aware of? What would you say is your worst quality? I know that's a firecracker of a question, so feel free to take your time and think it over. Snood smiles slightly. I do have a bit of a tendency to become emotionally enmeshed with my employer. Really? Rory says. Well, 
I'll be dashed. You look at Snood with slightly narrowed eyes, but Snood maintains a placid face. Uh, well, thank you, Snood, Rory says. We shall let you know in a matter of... Okay. Right. Do we say no? Oh, see, I don't like that. Emotionally enmeshed with our employer. What if... What if Snood becomes the new us and Rory falls for Snood? No, that would ruin everything. So we shake our head. No, Snood will not do. We can nod emphatically. Snood is the one. Well, you and Rory will have to discuss this at length later. I mean, let's discuss it later. We don't want to make a decision now. We'll get back to it. We'll get back to it. I think that's fair, isn't it? That seems about right. Now, we'll get back to you in a matter of a few days. I shall write to you, care of the Kedrick Club. Very good, sir. Good morning. And Snood departs. Rory closes the door. We'll have to discuss this. Tonight at length. I'm of two minds. Tonight, then, let us both consider carefully. It would be a big change. It really would. It would be a very big change indeed. Okay, right, moving on. You pick up the mail, which you did not get to yesterday. You put aside magazines and picture catalogues. Dear Cupboard. Hello. Oh, it's Mopsy. Okay, dear Cupboard. Hello, I am here at Ritonello, and I wanted to write to you to tell you that I am all right. After everything that happened at the Harvest Festival, I was thinking that you might think I would be desolate. I did cry for a long time until I felt like a sponge that had all the moisture squoze out of it. I sit in my room a good deal and write to figs. Everyone tells me to be patient, so I am being patient. I read a poem once about a woman in a tower who waited ever so long until she floated in a river and her night love said, Ta-ra, Lyra, <laughs> over a sad, dead self. But I still think my own poems are better. Okay, that's lost on me. I don't know what that poem is, but the night love saying... Tira Lyra. Sounds slightly bizarre, but okay. So I am here until something else happens. I think you should come and visit me, Cupboard. Things are more fun when you're about, and I won't make your life much too difficult this time. Please do come. Tira Lyra. Is that something that Tira Lyra? I don't, is that Italian or Latin or something? I don't know. Mopsy. P.S. Bring Rory too, of course. It is so odd that you and Rory fell in love. I would never have thought Rory would find a happy ending before me. Oh, well, that's good they did. Good you did, though, isn't it? It's good they all sort of went quite nicely. You put down the letter from Mopsy and then pick up another letter. This one from the Mayor of Woodland Centre. Oh, OK. Dear Cupboard, enclosed, please find a commemorative plaque for your victory in the Woodland Centre boat race. According to the Woodland Centre Historical Society, this was the best festival ever recorded. On a personal note, I've never enjoyed any boat racing quite as, as much as I did the big bearded Bernard. Indeed, I was sucking on a jawbreaker and swallowed it while I was jumping up and down, and I am told by my physician that this is the cause of my recent gastric distress, but that is neither here nor there. In short, your victory was honoured, uh, has honoured our fair town, and we all encourage you to return and race again next year, at which time I hope my aforementioned gastric distress will have sorted itself out. Yours truly, the Mayor of Woodland Centre. Then you pause, as you light upon a cream-coloured envelope with the address written in a heart-sinkingly familiar handwriting. You hand it to Rory, wordlessly. Uh-oh. Is this? It couldn't. It is from your Aunt Thistle, you say. She was mentioned earlier. Oh, my God, Rory says. Aunt Thistle, of course, is Aunt Primrose's less pleasant sister, who makes grizzle campaigners quake and retreat when she advances. Bands of young toughs cross the street when she approaches to avoid her direct gaze. She has always considered Rory to be a particularly wretched individual and has a habit of unleashing withering personal comments about Rory's future prospects and general waste of oxygen with little provocation. <laughs> oh no, she sounds terrible. She has invited, uh, that is to say, demanded that we come to her summer house in Long Island in New York, US of A, Penge, says Rory, holding the card by its corner between two fingertips and looking as if we would like to summon an exterminator. She needs us to help face her. Uh, sorry, what? She needs us to help her with some impending familial scandal. She specifically asks that I bring you or face the unleashed wrath of an aunt. Very ominous. We shall have to go, you say. Yes, we shall, Rory agrees. Ah, well, I suppose this is the beginning of another series of adventures for Rory and Cupboard. No, for Rory and Penge. You want to write all about us in a big book, Penge. People would love to read about us. It would sell a million copies. Well then, I suppose we can put off leaving for a few days. At any rate, let us put it from our minds. Shall we go for a bit of a stroll and talk of this and that? And together, you stroll out to enjoy the morning air. Freedom to choose? Oh, what, what is this? There's an extra bit at the end of the extra bit. Okay, I wasn't expecting this. A fresh breeze enters the window and you breathe in with satisfaction and contentment. You do not know precisely what comes next for you and you find that thought strangely liberating. You're alone for the moment, the house to yourself. You have time to sit and think. What do you want to do with your time now? 
Perhaps you would like to work in a shop. Perhaps you would take up a pen and create an amusing fictional narrative about your adventures over the years with Rory. Or perhaps you would do something else as yet unthought of by you. I, the novel sounds fun. I mean, you know, if only, if only uh, Cupboard and Rory's adventures had been put into words somewhere, that would be useful, wouldn't it? Then we could share them with the world. Maybe. Maybe we'll try writing a novel. That seems like a very cupboardy thing to do, doesn't it? Let's do that, shall we? You have quite a story to tell, you think, as you tap your pen over the blank piece of paper. It is a story that others might well be interested in if you can do it justice. There are elements of high comedy, sentiment and moral instruction, true love, misunderstanding, peacocks. You'll have to disguise the names, of course, to avoid embarrassing those closest to you, but the more you think about it, the more you become convinced that becoming a writer of fiction is your destiny. Weeks go by, and you fill page after page with lucid prose. The pages turn into neat stacks, and then the neat stacks begin to get less neat, acquiring thousands of arrows, strike-throughs, and amended passages written in the margins. You sip your tea, absolutely brilliant, filled with the calm pleasure of creation, and write until it grows quite dark. The end. Let's press it, because I don't know what's going to happen. Do we get something else? And there we go. The end indeed. We hope you've enjoyed playing it on a scale of one to ten. Ten, most likely. Let's recommend it to all of our friends. And there we go. Then we get the whole sort of uh, email bump stuff. Do you know what then? Now we've done this, let's just have a quick look at the stats. Because I would be intrigued to see what our stats look like. So here we go. This is what the stats look like. We haven't seen this yet because I tried to avoid this. Because, you know, if I knew that we were good at persuading people then um, you know, maybe if a persuade option came up, I would have been choosing that to try and, you know, sort of win, if you like. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to play it, you know, as Cupboard would have played it, not to win the game. So bold, 50, cultured, not very cultured. Um, intellect, quite smart. Observation, kind of about halfway. Persuasion skills, quite good. Skullduggery, no, we weren't very nefarious, were we? We were not very good at that at all. Uh, we were quite soothing, but a little bit abrasive at points. I thought that might have been a bit higher. Our reputation, so renown, 50%, tranquility, 50%, suspicion, 43 and invitation, 30 um, And then, yeah, our reputation with all the different characters. So Rory, only 76%. Yet, you know, we're now together. I thought maybe that would be slightly higher. Uh, Valentine, 50%, frankincense, 54 Arm Primrose, only 36%. We really did try. Colonel Firesnuff, 44%. Hang on. So we had a better reputation with Colonel Firesnuff than we did with Aunt Primrose. After all the stuff we did for her, my goodness. Uh, Regina, 37%. Hayes, 66%. And Mopsy, 100%. So if we'd have wanted to, we could have gone down the route of, you know, having a sort of a bit of a romantic liaison with Mopsy, possibly. I do not know. And Ready Money's 396. Wow, we are fabulously wealthy. Good grief. Okay. Well, there we go. There we go. There are the stats. Let's just get back. Hang on, hang on. Let me skip out this. Let's get back to the kind of the front screen or something like that. So there we go. Tally Ho is complete. The journey has come to an end. The tale is done. And what a wonderful time we've had with it. It's been really, really good. I have thoroughly enjoyed every bit of Tally Ho. And you know, I think we got a good ending as well. I think we ended up with a pretty good ending. All the characters seem to be quite happy with what was going on in their lives. I mean, Mopsy perhaps not quite as happy as the others. Some of them, we don't know where they got to. For example, where's Hayes? I don't know. What did Hayes go and do? I'm not entirely sure. Is she going around doing more crimes? I would assume so. So, you know, there are some unanswered questions, but that was wonderful. It was a lot of fun. It got far more farcical than I thought it was going to at points. There were some very wonderfully silly bits, like the chase. The chase through the um, through the house where we stole the money from the Baccarat game. That was wonderful. That was all very silly. And then, of course, the ongoing kind of romantic liaisons with Rory, and it kind of started off with just, you know, some, some sort of longing looks and such like, and then and it ended up with that kind of sort of rough and tumble kind of hug type, you know, romantic kind of tussle thing on the floor in front of Aunt Primrose, who thought that Rory was fighting a burglar or whatever. So, yeah, it was very silly. It was very silly. But then, of course, for all those farcical moments, there were other moments of seriousness and that kind of stuff. So, you know, it was a very good story. It worked very, very well indeed. And I have thoroughly enjoyed every single bit of it. It has been splendid. But, of course, it brings it to a close. And also Sunday night story time. It'll bring that to a close for now. We might come back to it. We might come back. There are other games like this. There is a sequel to Tally Ho as well. I think for now, yeah, we'll park it for now. 
but we might well come back to it. We might well have another kind of another round of Sunday night story time at some point in the future. But uh, but yeah, it's been brilliant. I've thoroughly enjoyed Tally Ho and hopefully you all have enjoyed it too. If you have, please do leave a like. That would be most marvellous indeed. And also, if you're not already, then please do subscribe to keep up to date with all the other bits and bobs and nonsense that we get up to in the Geek Cupboard. But for now, thank you very much for joining me and Rory, of course, in the Geek Cupboard and I will see you next time. Charlotte was murdered by Martin. Do we need to arrest Martin? Aaron was murdered by Martin. The mighty defense rectangle has been completed. We've crashed into a ship over there. Hello, pirates. They're just firing bits of explosive junk. It's killing quite a lot of pirates. Connor was strangled by Martin. Somebody stop him. I'd love to stop him. <laughs>